What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome to another segment of Exposing Tawheed. Got my, my family up here on the stage with me. Got Sam, Shimon, just a friend. Uh, it's Encyclopedia. Sam Shimon, what's going on with you? What are you saying? Brother? I'm shaped like a bookshelf or you something? You are shaped like a bookshelf, my friend. You oh, got to get in that gym, man. Wasn't I'm you trying. working out? Don't oh, hate, bro. Now you're not even taking, you're taking it too far, buddy. <laughs> no, you was, when you was flexing on the screen, I was I was like, okay, I That's see right, you. Man. Don't, don't hate. You still man. got it, right? Yeah, I still got it, man. Better than you. Okay. <laughs> when, they when, you when they say you two turn sideways, you disappear. Is that true? Oh, no, no, that ain't true, man. I got a little bit of meat on my bones. Man. Yeah, all right, brother. <laughs> That's all good in the hood. So we got That's some right. faces I don't recognize. I see. So don't taste. And that's me, man. I'm, I'm quite handsome, bro. Then we got Dink. I don't know who Dink is, but anyway. All right, brethren. This is, uh, I thought we'd finish it today, but I don't know because we haven't talked about the Ruach, the spirit. Right. right. That's also very important because in Islamic theology, well, particularly Shia, Sunni Islam, they'll tell you that the Ruach, the spirit, the Arabic word for spirit, Ruch, you know, Ruch al -Qudus, yep. the spirit of the Holy or the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel, which we're going to destroy that lie, Lord Jesus willing. I don't know if we'll do it in this session. Maybe we'll do one final one and we'll be done. Yeah. Let's see how much the time this takes. We'll see. Well, I'm down. I'm down. Welcome, everybody, to the stream. You guys, you guys heard Sam right now. We've been going over. If you haven't seen our videos, we've been going over little steps, exposing Tawheed, showing how it's incoherent how it doesn't make sense, how it falls upon itself in Islamic sources. So yep. uh, that's what we've been doing right now. I, I believe we're going to go into the Quran and its implications and how it causes trouble to Tawheed. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, for the Sunni Muslims in particular. So re remember, some of these arguments are unique to Sunni Islam. So you may have Quran-only Muslims, quran yun, quran -i. Most of the arguments we use won't affect them. The only arguments that would affect them are those passages that we appeal to from the Quran. Quranic passages will work with Quran-only Muslims. And when you're dealing with Islamic tradition, majority Muslims profess to be Sunni. So these arguments work for Sunni Muslims, but it doesn't work necessarily for Shia. Because uh, from my understanding, the Shia are the heirs of the Mutazilites and do not believe the Quran is uncreated. So... But then I've been told otherwise. And that's the difficulty when you deal with Shia Islam. They keep their sources, for the most part, hidden. Yeah. They're not as open as translating their sources. And this is why we've got to thank the Sunni Muslims. They have been very open in translating their most authoritative, important works in English. And thank God for that. So if you don't know Arabic, then you're going to struggle with Shia Islam. So either you have to have someone who <clears throat> was a former Muslim, who now follows Jesus Christ, who reads Arabic, or... Arabic Christians who can read the sources to do the work for you. But with Sunni Islam, their major collections, their most authentic, authorita authoritative sources have been translated in English. Glory to the Triune God for that. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this particular session is unique to Sunni Islam. It may not work with Shia, and it won't work with Quran-only Muslims. But before we begin anything, brother, maybe the Spirit can move someone to pray because we need the Holy Spirit to take over the session, take over my words to speak clearly and accurately and to bless us to know how to expose Islam so Muslims get saved for the glory of Jesus Christ and the church gets strengthened to know there is no other <clears throat> Lord to turn to except the Lord Jesus Christ and there is no other book that God has inspired except the Holy Bible. Amen. Amen. Brother Chris, you uh, mind leading us in prayer? Can you? You got it, brother. Thank you. I pray to you, Father, in the name of your Son and by the power of your Spirit, that you grant Sam the ability to speak clearly and boldly through the Spirit to take captive any argument against your Holy Scriptures. I pray for the safety of Christians being persecuted in Muslim lands. I pray you take care and solve conflicts around the world. I also pray for our brothers and sisters fighting through health problems or mental health issues. I pray you reach down and help them, Father. I also ask for those fighting cancer or any other ailments people may have. Dear God, you know us better than we are. We know ourselves. Please give us the strength to keep striving for you. 
I would also like to lift up some of your other strong soldiers as well, so that me, you may keep blessing them and their families. Sister Hatun Tash and Daughter of Christ, Brother Jay from Jay Apologetics, the Biblicist Debit Ray, Prophet Google, Sheikh Umad, Gopal's Ministry to the Hindus, Brothers Christian Prince, Rob Christian, Al Fadi, David Wood, Jay Smith, Sam Shimon, AK Sniper, Dr. Tony Costa, Steve Hussein, Anthony Rogers, Brother Ask Truth Apologetics, Islam Critiqued, Lloyd DeJong, Christian TV, Crossing the Crescent, and also Sister K from London, and our brother God Logic Apologetics with Sister Chloe and her apologetics for saving life. <laughs> I also ask God that you watch over the women giving birth this year and early next year. May their children love you, Lord. I also ask that you bring Muslims and his Hebrew Israelites back home to you. Lastly, I ask that through this stream today, just one comes to know the knowledge of the true triune God. I ask this in the name of your glorious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Yeah, I don't know if you mentioned Somali Christian TV. You said Christian TV. What were you referring to them? Yes, yeah, Somali Christian TV. Sorry, yeah, Sam. I know. Yeah, I didn't know. But glory to the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit again. I come in agreement with you and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to guide my tongue by his spirit, to speak clearly and accurately, to represent the Muslim sources perfectly, save us from attacks of Satan, rebuke all satanic temptation, <clears throat> all satanic attacks, as we're covered and washed, purified in the holy blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son. And may the Lord Jesus strengthen my throat with the health I need, so my voice stays strong for his glory, not for my praise. And may the Lord Jesus increase in us, and may we all decrease. Watch over our loved ones for his glory in Jesus' name. Yelver Rafa, Yelver Rafa, Yelver Rafa, Father, Son, Spirit. All right. Now, I'm going to have to send you some links so that people can have access to the material. Now, when I send you links at the bottom, I usually, not in every post, but majority of posts, link to other articles and rebuttals. Yeah. Because a lot of the materials that you'll find that where we go in depth are found on answeringislam.info. So what you find on the blog is usually a summation of some of the lengthier articles, rebuttals we've written on answering Islam. That's why I link to the lengthier rebuttals for those of you who don't mind spending time reading lengthy posts. Because I know a lot, now we live at a time where reading a book becomes hard. It's even hard for me. Or being patient enough to go through an article that's 20, 30 pages. That's kind of too much for many people to handle. But don't forget, as I said in the previous session, I'm going to repeat it again. Before YouTube, before Clubhouse, before Discord, before <clears throat> Facebook Live, if you wanted to rebut someone, you had to do it through written means. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, Christian websites, refuting Muslim websites, vice versa, would write lengthy Articles. Some of my articles are about 30 to 40 pages long. So now I realize that's the way the dodo bird. No one wants to read 30 to 40 page articles, rebuttals. But you know what? In those articles, rebuttals, you'll find a lot of meat, a lot of gold, treasures, in-depth exegesis of scripture by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. In-depth exposition where we refute Islam and show why it cannot be true in Muhammad is a false prophet. So <clears throat> I would highly encourage you when I give these links, do access <clears throat> the link to your articles, rebuttals, the links to which you'll find in these posts on my blog. So let me get it for you in Jesus' name, by the grace of our God, Father, so in Jesus' mighty name. I'm going to send it to you on Facebook, sir. So let me get there. It's just too much to navigate, sir. Just be patient with me. I'm patient, Sam. You know me. Are you? Oh, man. Yeah, you, you, you probably you make a great doctor. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> hey, don't laugh at me, bro. I'm sensitive. Uh, I says, I have low self-esteem when <laughs> people laugh at me. Someone else laughing at me, too? What is it? Yeah, everybody's laughing at you now, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Everybody but me, of course. That's because you are, you, are, you are the closest thing to infallibility, sir. <laughs> right. Okay, here, no, let me get you the link. Right, I'm getting, yeah, you're la you're laughing. You can't laugh with me. I got to laugh first. Come on, man. You know that. Hey, where, where? Well, that was from a film. What movie did we? I hear that from. I remember watching the movie. <laughs> it was a comedy. The guy said, "Hey, you laughing with me?" Oh yeah, yeah. Anger management. That's right. <laughs> you guys seen that movie? Anger management. 
Jack Hello. Nicholson and Adam Sandler. Yeah, yeah. The guy is, says, hey, man, you laughing at me? Well, you can't be laughing with me because I ain't laughing. So that just stuck, to, you know, stuck with me like a sore thumb. Anyway, that's one. And here's the second one. So here you go, brother. The two links. Share it. We're going to begin. Uh, the titles are Debate Challenge to Muslim Metaphysician Part 2. A while back, I'd written a multi-part. Let me let me put on my hold on, internet because it says my phone and their porn connection. Hold on. A while back, I had challenged Muslim metaphysician to debate me on the coherence of the Quran, whether the Quran or the Islamic concept of Tawheed will even a doctrine having to be logically coherent in order for it to be true. He never accepted the challenge. Be that as it may, I did write a series of posts where you Christians will be able to take the arguments and show that according to these so-called Muslim logicians who think and pride themselves on being logically consistent or philosophers, that if they're consistent, they're going to have to reject Islam because Islamic Tawheed cannot live up to their own demands on logical consistency and coherence because Tawheed is anything but logically coherent. It's irrational, not super rational. It's irrational. It's incoherent babble, as I'm about to prove by the power of the Holy Spirit, and as I've already demonstrated in previous sessions. So here in part two, I focus on the Quran, that if Jake is going to be consistent, because he's now a Sunni Muslim. A lot of people don't know that Jake used to be a Quran-only Muslim. In fact, let me just take a few minutes, not to bore you, but this is important. One of the leading Muslim debaters in the 90s happened to be Hamza Abdul Malik. You'll find his debates now on YouTube. He actually had a debate with James White on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hamza Abdul Malik disappeared from the scene for a while and then reappeared. Now, people wondered why he disappeared. Because he became a Quran-only Muslim. And he started attacking Sunni Islam as being pagan and idolatrous. You guys aware of this? No, I didn't know that about him. Hamza Abdul Malik is also the mentor of Shadid Lewis. If you guys don't know who Shadid is, uh, is uh, yeah, he's the, he's the he's the dog on here, that wild emotional dog on here. Now let, let me just share something with you. I met Shadid Lewis in person. Don't let his passion mislead you, because remember, he's convinced Islam is true, so he's passion. Just like I know Jesus is Lord, the Bible is true, so I also go after Muslims and give them a taste of their medicine in a very not charitable manner. When you get to meet Shadid. I met him in person several times. He's one of the nicest, sweetest human beings you'll ever meet. Him and his wife. I know people. He's see out him. here. He's out here cussing us out, Sam. Yeah, well, brother, you understand. Some people are just passionate. Look at me. That's call, not passion, Sam. You don't. Be, friend, you, sir. You I call people spiritual bastards and whores, and I use the King James language. Yes, bastard is in the Bible, by the way. Hebrews 12, right? I've never heard Four. you say, shut the F up, mother F -er. Can I say, shut the fudge up? What about fudge? Is that all right? <laughs> Would that be okay? Yeah, that will be all right. Okay, now, not to go into a tangent, but the point was, Hamza Abdul Malik is Shadid Lewis's teacher in apologetics. Remind me later to get you the link. Hamza Abdul Malik has become a nightmare <clears throat> to Sunni Muslims. He found a book by a Muslim showing why Sunni Islam is idolatry because it's elevated Muhammad to divine status, making Muhammad a partner with Allah. And Hamza Abdul Malik is still active, but on another channel on YouTube, destroying Sunni Islam from the Quran and showing from the Hadith that Sunni Muslims are pagans, idolaters, and they have deified Muhammad. Now, Jake used to be part of his group and he has a lecture of Jake when he was a Quran only Muslim. Do you guys want me to get you that? Yeah, do that. <laughs> okay, let me do it right now. Hold on. He's got the lecture when Jake was a Quran only Muslim, but for some reason became a Sunni Muslim. And now I am positive he regrets it because he didn't know the avalanche of arguments raised against him now that he's a Sunni Muslim, showing that Tawheed is a joke and it's logically incoherent. I'm sure he now wishes that he had remained. A Quran only Muslim. And here's the link. Maybe you can open up, show it to them. Here it is. Let me find it to you, Jake. In fact, there's a couple of them. Here, do me a favor. Here it is. Not one or two. Quran only versus Quran and Hadith. Jake 
Bran Catella. Hadith and Sunni are not the wisdom. Jake Bran Catella. Quran plus Hadith plus Sunnah equals shirk. Jake Bran Catella. So he's got three videos of him when he's a Quran only Muslim. Let me send it to you on YouTube. Here's the channel where here's the this is Hamza Yusuf uh, Hamza Yusuf Hamza Abdul Malik's page. This is his videos. Subscribe. This guy will give you meat from the Quran to destroy Sunni Islam. Now, if you click on it, you will see the three videos by Jake when he was a Quran only Muslim. You'll see it right there on the main page. If you scroll down, you'll see it says Quran plus Hadith plus Sunnah equals shirk. Jake. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Pran Catella, bronchitis, whatever you want, however you want to say it, right? The Muslim metaphysician, right there, it says it. And then you scroll, you'll see Quran alone versus Quran and Hadith. This is when he was a Quran only Muslim, destroying the Hadith and the Sunnah. Surprise, 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 David. You got? Did you <laughs> see, see the videos? Yeah, this is crazy. I didn't. I had no idea this dude used to be a Quran only. I had no idea. Hold yes, on, sir. That's why they hate me, dude, because I expose them warts and all. And notice that the YouTube channel is called Quran versus Hadith. So share and Chris, everyone else. Now you got gold to go after Jake. Wait, Jake, weren't you a Quran only Muslim and you use arguments to destroy the Hadith? How is it now you're a Sunni Muslim? And I guarantee you, if he's going to continue this path, he's going to leave Sunni Islam because he's going to realize, I cannot defend Tawheed as defined by the Quran and the Sunnah. I can't do I think, it. Uh, hey, Sam, I think later in the future, I think uh, Quran-only Jank Brancatella is going to be having a debate with uh, yes. uh, Hadith and Quran uh, only, <laughs> Jake Brancatella on my channel. The same as uh, I had... Uh, Abu Yazid and uh, CL Edwards uh, debating on my channel as well. Yeah, do that. That was pretty so funny. Start make, maybe start making clips where you have Jake refuting himself, just like CL Edwards destroys Abu Yazid. But yeah, you got it now. It's right there. And did you see the videos, brother, before I move on? Yes, sir. Got them. And then did uh, Avery, did you see the videos by Jake? I can't hear him. Is he muted? Yeah, he's muted. He's not listening to you, Sam. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm muted because when I when I click on these links, that's what it messes up uh, your headphones. So that's gotta, that's fine. But you saw the videos with Jake? Yeah, you know? yeah I, I I didn't see Jake. I saw the, that guy though. I just had no, to no. But lay, scroll down. Find the Jake. There are three of them. You can't miss it. You're gonna see one of them. He's wearing a red shirt and he's lecturing because he has annual conferences. And then the other two, you see his face with his cap. It's right there. Make sure you see it. Scroll down. You'll see it. I want to make sure you see it before we begin. Yeah, I see it now. <laughs> That's him. He is. All right. <laughs> That's him. All right. So wow, now he's got crazy. more ammunition to expose these inconsistent trolls because this is what it is. Our Bible tells us, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7, 8. So when you try to sow <clears throat> in such a way where you blaspheme the true God, rob Jesus of his glory, mock his Bible, and try to bully his servants, the true God will rise to shame you and expose you and even hand you over a spirit of stupor, stupidity. And that's in Romans 11, verses 7 to 10. But there you go, guys. Now, with that said, that article, the reason why he came up is because I wrote this in anticipation of him accepting my challenge to debate whether Tawheed is logically consistent. But are you surprised that he never did? Of course not. Now, the other article that I sent you is a thorough exposition and refutation of Uthman Farouk's lie when he lied to Anthony Rogers and said that the statement, the hadith of the Quran appearing as a pale man is weak, daif, by partially quoting Sheikh El Albani and not quoting him in full. And both Adam Seeker and myself did a session exposing him. And I wrote this for that session. And even Christian Prince did a session exposing him. So, guys, this post was written to destroy Uthman's lie that the hadith from Ibn Majah that says the Quran will appear as a pale man is daif. Yeah, he tried to say that was weak and going to the books and stuff. I yeah, and he didn't even quote Albani in context. And Albani right. did say that in a certain that a certain chain that's weak, but from another chain, it's actually it's Hassan. It's good. He didn't quote the full. Source, but that's okay because we're not going to focus on either of these gentlemen. Just letting you know, 
the material that I'll be discussing is there. And at the bottom, I link to further, more in-depth articles and refutations by the grace of Jesus Christ. So let's begin. This only works with Sunni Muslims. It won't work with Quran-only Muslims because they don't believe in the Sunnah. In Sunni Islam, if you are a Sunni, what they call Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, I love the Arabic terms. It's sad that Satan used Muhammad to rob Arabic and steal it from being a language used to glorify Jesus Christ. Because if we believe in the Bible, Christ created all languages to be used to glorify him and no one right. else. The Father, Son, the eternal love of the Spirit. So we're going to reclaim Arabic for the Lord Jesus. But anyway, the term is Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah. Okay. <laughs> the people of the Sunnah and what the Jama means, the congregation. In official, authentic Sunni Islam, you must affirm the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. In the articles and rebuttals that you'll find in the post and <clears throat> links to other articles on answering Islam, you'll even have Muslims and scholars of Islam saying, guys, you got to listen because now we begin, that Sunni Islam's view of the Quran is the Trinitarian view of Jesus. In other words, Christians make a mistake when they think that the Sunni view of the Quran is similar to the Christian view of the Bible. No. The Sunni view of the Quran is our view of Jesus. And you have Muslims admitting this and scholars of Islam who are not Muslim but are bona fide scholars of Islam saying, that the Christian understanding of the Logos becoming incarnate, that the eternal word of God becoming enfleshed is similar to the sin of you of the eternal word of Allah becoming a book. So we believe in incarnation. They believe in inlibration, meaning we believe God's eternal word became flesh. They believe God's eternal word became a book. And you even have scholars of Islam likening Muhammad to Mary in that Mary conveyed the word to us in the flesh, and Muhammad conveyed Allah's word to us in a book. So you Christians are making a mistake when you debate Quran versus the Bible, because our view of the Bible is not their view of the Quran. The Sunni view of the Quran is our view of Jesus. So you need to debate Jesus versus the Quran, not the Quran versus the Bible. Everyone with me so far? Yep, that's pretty clear. Okay. In fact, the Bible is not one book. It's a collection of books. So even debating the Quran versus Bible, that is wrong because the Quran supposedly is one book transmitted through one author, whereas we're debating a collection of books transmitted through different authors inspired by the Spirit. So if you really want to debate the Bible versus the Quran, you have to take a book of the Bible and contrast that with the Quran, not take a collection of books written at different times by different authors and contrast that with a single book that supposedly came through one human vehicle. So that too is wrong. So from any angle you look at it, it's wrong to debate a collection of books and try to affirm the divine inspiration of those books in contrast to one book that supposedly came through one human agent. Especially when their view of the Quran is not our view of the Bible. Their view of the Quran is our view of Jesus. And this was even admitted by the Mutazilites. Let me now repeat some of the things I mentioned in previous sessions. You need to remember the Mutazilites. Mutazila. The Mutazilites were a group of Muslim logicians who were influenced by Greek philosophy and logic, Aristotelian logic. And because of Aristotelian logic, condemned those Muslims who said that the Quran being the speech of Allah, Arabic kalam Allah, is uncreated. So though it's not Allah, it is not other than Allah. And again, you'll find in the writings of Muslims, and I quote some of them, we're going to go through some of them. So when the Sunni Muslims, or the group that became known as Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the Sunni Muslims, when they would discuss what they call the Sifat, and I don't mean to use Arabic to try to sound intelligent, but these are the terms you need to be familiar with. Sifat means attributes or characteristics. It's plural. Sifa is attribute, characteristic. These Sunni Muslims said that the sifat, the attributes, characteristics of Allah, are not Allah, but they are not other than Allah. And they would also say, Billa kaifa, 
bilakeif, meaning they are not identical to Allah, but they are not separate from Allah. So you can't say they're Allah, but you can't deny they're other than Allah. They're inseparable from Him, but they're not identical to Him. And it is something that we don't fully comprehend. It's beyond comprehension. Allah knows. Bilakeifa. That was the term they came up with. So far with me? With you so far, Sam. Since the Quran, the Quran is one of his attributes, his kalam, it too is not Allah, but it's not other than Allah. So you can't say it's Allah, but you can't deny it's Allah. So then the Mutazilites in the ninth century, and you thank God for Chef Google. Whereas we had to get books to, to find this out. You can go to Google, put in the Mihna, M-I-H-N-A, an Islamic Inquisition. In the ninth, ninth century, around 830, when the caliphs were Mutazilites, like the caliph Ma'mun, Ma'mun, when the caliphs were Mutazilites, they were beating, imprisoning, and killing those Muslims who said the Quran is uncreated. Why? Because they accused these Sunnis of being no different than the Christians. The Mutazilites actually said, what makes you different from the Christians who say that the Word of God became flesh? Because you're saying something similar, but you're saying the Word of God became a book. And so the Caliph Ma'mun, M-A-M-U-N, and then his successor, Al-Mutim, M-U-T-I-M, started persecuting, imprisoning, beating, and or killing Muslims who said the Quran was uncreated. Incredible. <laughs> now, why don't Muslims tell you this, this part of their history? Oh, they don't tell us none of the history. In fact, the Mutazilites are akin to the Aryans in our history. See, now Valerian even beat me to it. If you go on YouTube, he just said it. Yep. What do I mean? In the fourth century, so guys, I have to give you a little history, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to help me recall the facts clearly because I don't want to misinform you guys. You know, my success comes from the grace of the Lord Jesus, He gets the glory. Anything wrong or mistaken or sinful, we blame Avery for that. He takes responsibility. <laughs> oh, wow. That's right. well, okay, okay. Not you then, Chris. All right. How about there that, you Chris? Go. Right. Right. Okay, so <laughs> in the fourth century, there was a priest from Africa, Alexander Egypt, named Arius, who also was influenced by Greek philosophy. Isn't that ironic? Yeah. He was influenced by Neoplatonic thinking, the, the views of Plotinus and others. Because in, in Greek thinking, you had what is known as the monad, the immovable mover. And this monad, right, because the Greeks thought that the material universe was impure, like evil, so to speak. And so the Greeks wanted to be liberated from the material universe, and they wanted to be liberated from their material bodies. That's why many Greeks were offended at the Christian view of bodily resurrection. They wanted to get rid of the body. You're telling us we're going to be stuck in the body? So the monad wouldn't, quote unquote, dirty himself by creating a material universe. So what did he do? He created a semi-divine being called the de de Demiurge. That Demiurge did the dirty work. That Demiurge is the one that created the material universe. So the monad remained untainted, unpolluted by the material universe because he created the semi-divine being, the Demiurge, and he did the dirty work of creating the material universe. So guess what? Arius being influenced by Greek philosophy said, oh, then the monad is God the Father and the Demiurge is the Son whom he created in eternity. So because of Greek philosophy, he too came up with a view that the Logos, the Son, Jesus, is not eternal with the Father, but the first thing the Father brought into being. And then that Logos, that Son, he then created everything else, including the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so the true believers, the heirs of the apostles, who were disciples of the bishops, who were disciples of the bishops, who were disciples of the apostles, rose up to combat this heresy in the 4th century. And the champion was Athanasius, saying, no, that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what we receive from the apostles. Because their successors passed on what they received from the apostles, not only in scriptures, but orally. And they pass it on to us. Jesus is not created. He is consubstantial with the Father, begotten but not made. And hence the Council of Nicaea. But Islam has its own 
quote unquote Aryan heresy, the Mutazilites, and they have their own quote unquote council, so to speak. It's more of an inquisition, the Mihna, where the Mutazilite caliphs persecuted, imprisoned, beat, and or killed those Muslims who said the Quran is uncreated. Ironic that they had something similar, but they don't tell you this, do they? Never. I've never heard this from a Muslim. Right? Honestly, I, I never learned any Islam from a Muslim, just to be honest with you. Because they don't want you to know this. Yeah. All right. Now, here's what's interesting. Similarly to the Mutazilites and the so called Sunni Muslims coming to clash and persecuting and killing each other, are you aware that according to records about Nicaea, there were 318 bishops that attended? They said 302 of them all had physical injuries because they actually came to blows and started beating each other up. No, I did not get to that part of the story. <laughs> the Christians of the fourth century were not like today, like, hey, brother, just love everyone. Turn the other cheek. They would actually smash your cheek in. Yeah. <laughs> so you would have fit in there? Man, I, man, I'm born in the wrong era, dude. <laughs> the soft, right. soft gospel, man. They said there are people who had limbs missing or eyes missing or bruises. They actually physically came to blows in the streets wow. over this issue. That's how serious they took the first of say, Jesus so, Christ. I was going to say, some, some people got to remember, our Lord and Savior came in flipping tables. Yeah, but come on, brother. Just, you're just misinterpreting the Greek. You don't know Greek, sir. Shame <laughs> on you. All right, but anyway. In fact, this is a tradition that I have no reason to belie. Santa Claus was at the Council of Nicaea. I'm not, I'm not lying. Santa Claus was there. St. Nicholas, from uh, where we get Santa Claus, he was there. St. Nicholas, the story of Santa Claus is based on this 4th century church uh, saint, St. Nicholas. He was there. Tradition says he got so angry at Arius for spewing his blasphemy against Jesus. that one tradition says St. Nicholas smacked him. Another says he punched him. Incredible. No, it is true. I read it. It's online. So there's no reason to belie the tradition. It says, and he was thrown in prison for it. But then he had a vision of the Lord Jesus and the Blessed Mother appearing, and he was set free the next day. Re go, guys, again, you don't need to buy the books. Google it, St. Nicholas. So he was very naughty, not nice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you better watch out. You better not pout. You better not shout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is going to jack you across the jaw. <laughs> okay, so with all that said, who won out eventually in Islam? The Sunni Muslims. Mm. They're the majority sect. They say roughly 85% of those professing to be Muslims are Sunni. And Sunni Muslims must affirm the Quran is uncreated. Wow. They won out. They became the majority. The Mutazilites pretty much lost their power and influence. So they say that some of the Mutazilite ideas survive in Shia Islam. Some, not all. So that Shia Islam basically inherited some of their views from the Mutazilites. So with that said, keep that in mind. Majority of Muslims that profess to be Sunni must believe the Quran is uncreated. So again, lest you think I'm making it up, in that post on Muslim metaphysician, I'm going to read, excuse me, I'm going to read the English translation done by Hamza Yusuf of the creed of Imam At-Tahawi a medieval Sunni Muslim scholar who wrote a creed that to this day the Muslims swear by. Sunni Muslims, when I say Muslims. Now, when I say Muslims, understand I mean Sunni Muslims. So I don't have to keep saying Sunni Muslims, right? So here I quote, and by the way, an English translation of this creed is found online for free. I happen to get the version produced by Hamza Yusuf. So here it is, the creed of Imam Al-Tahawi, Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyah. Translated, annotated, and introduced by Hamza Yusuf. Zaytuna Institute, year 2007, page 54. All the emphasis comes from me. So note, here's what it says. Point 35. This is something that all Sunni Muslims must affirm. The Quran is the word of God that emanated from him. So it's an emanation from him. Almost sounds modalistic, doesn't it? Yeah. It's an emanation. <laughs> sounds like Gnostic, doesn't it? An emanation, because that's what Gnostics believed. They were aeons that emanated from the Pleroma, right? Emanation, modalism, right? Because Islam inherited Gnosticism, Manichaeism, <clears throat> all 
kinds of perversions rolled up in one. But anyway, the Quran is the word of God that emanated from him without modality in its expression. He sent it down to his messenger as a revelation. The believers accept it as such literally. They are certain it is in reality the word of God, the sublime and exalted. Unlike human speech, this is point 36 from the book, it is eternal and uncreated. Everyone caught it? Got it. Unlike human speech, it is eternal, uncreated. Okay. Now, point 73 from the same book, page 64. We do not argue about the Quran. Rather, we testify that it is the word of the Lord of the, world, the universe as revealed through the trustworthy spirit who taught it to the paragon of messengers, Muhammad. It is the word of God, the sublime and exalted. No mortal speech compares to it, and we do not say it is created. What a merc. <laughs> now here, I quote from an online source. Well, let me see before I go there, because, yeah. But before I tell you, because I have a lot of citations, I want to quote the juiciest and most relevant. No, this one is also, this comes from the creed of Ibn Abi Zayyid. El K, uh, these Arabic names, boy, they kill my lisp. K Rawani. Ibn Abi Zayyid El K Rawani. Being a translation of Muqaddima Al Risala Ibn Abi Zayyid El K Rawani by Imam Abu Muhammad Abdullah Ibn Abi Zayyid El K Rawani. Say that name three times fast. Okay. With commentary by Sheikh Ahmad Ibn Yahya Al Najim. Pages 68 to 73. Let me read. I quote. This is another creed. Sunni creed that both Ashari, Maturidi, and the Salafi swear by. So let's read. I quote. Ahlul Sunnah declare the following. We believe that the attribute of speech to be Qaddim al naw Hadith Al-Ahad, which means that in its essence, Allah's speech is eternal. And he speaks whenever he wants, the way he wants. Saying Qaddim al naw No means that speech is an attribute of the divine essence, hence eternal as it exists due by his essence. So it's an attribute of his essence, right? It's a part of his essence and all his essence that obviously they believe is uncreated. With neither has an end nor a beginning. The following ayat establish clear incontrovertible proof. Allah's speech in a manner that befits his majesty and supremacy, which is an eternal, everlasting, and perfect attribute of his essence. Allah said, and indeed Allah spoke to Musa with direct speech. So they're saying that speech obviously is uncreated moreover allah said and the word of your lord has been fulfilled in truth and in justice none can alter his words and he is the hearing the knowing and anam anam al anam that's how they pronounce it. i say anam like adam's ad up and adam i know but it's al anam chapter 6 verse 115 i seek refuge in the perfect word from the evil of what he created nothing would harm him until he marches from that stopping place all these are proof enough to affirm that the attribute of speech of Allah, Most High, the Quran is the word of Allah, Kalam Allah, which he sent down to a slave and messenger to remain as a source of legislation for mankind until the day of judgment. He described himself with it by adding it as a genitive to his name in the verse, and if any one of the idolaters seek thy protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the words of Allah, then deliver him to his place of safety, that is because there are people who do not know. Al-Tawbah chapter 9 verse 6. Now, what is what is he saying here? That in chapter 9 verse 6, when it says the words of Allah, it means the Quran. It's the Quran being identified as the words of Allah. And it's in the possessive, meaning the words that belong to Allah. It's his words originating from him. So the source goes on to say, Therefore, he who claims that the Quran is created is deemed a disbeliever. Did you guys catch it? Got I, don't it. Want to, I don't want to move on until you get it. What was my connection poor? Okay. Here you're told if you're a Sunni Muslim, if you dare say the Quran is created, you are a kafir. And if you're deemed a kafir, your blood can be shed. You can be killed. I'm not joking. You can be killed. Okay? So, so Sam, let, let's say Jake the fake, the Muslim metamagician there. Let's say he <laughs>, laughs and jokes about the Quran being eternal and doubts that the Quran is eternal. What would happen to him in Islamic state? No, he'd have to be killed. If you have a, a bona fide Islamic state, 
by a caliph, he'd be killed. It's no joking matter. But in the West, he can get away with it. In the West, he can get away with it. Meaning, you know, you don't have an Islamic state. And therefore, he can get away with mocking Islam, but not for long, because if he's in a Muslim country and the, the wrong Muslim finds him, he's gone. He's a goner. In fact, by the way, side note, if you guys look at what Al-Qaeda did in Iraq or in Syria or ICE did, they killed more Muslims than they did non-Muslims. You guys aware of this? No. Yes, sir. It's by, yes. I think it's uh, because of the call for jihad, isn't it, Sam? They killed the Shia Muslims because to them, the Shia are not real Muslims. So why are the Shia not real Muslims? Because number one, there are many who would say the Quran is not created and they would say that today's Quran is not perfect. The true Quran is hidden and the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, will appear with the true Quran because they say that the Quran today has been tampered with, right, the Shia, and they curse the companions of Muhammad and curse Aisha. So the... Sunni terrorists, the Salafi terrorists, the jihadis, Al Qaeda, ICE murdered more of them than non, murdered more of them than non Muslims. See, that's a fact. Now, what about the Sunni Muslims? Because they also killed the Sunni Muslims. Well, the reason why they killed the Sunni Muslims because in chapter five, verse fifty-one, Surah Al Maidah says, "A Muslim who takes a Jew or a Christian as a friend, a wali or awliya." The Jews and Christians as awliya, friends or protectors, they are no better than them. In other words, they're just like them, meaning the verse says they're not really Muslims, so they can be killed. Wow. That's Surah, Surah al Now, some will tell you, if you look at chapter 5, verse 51, no, the word awliya means to look for them as your protectors, like seeking protection from them. Baloney. That's baloney. Why? Because the word awliya is used in chapter 10, verse 62. It says, Allah has awliya. In fact, can you do me a favor, Avery, if you can look at chapter 5, verse 51 and 1062 real quickly. Yeah. Don't put up your Quran browser. browser. Let me get there. <clears throat> so 5 what? Chapter 5, verse 51, and then right after I read chapter 10, verse 62. All right, 551, it says... O believers, take not Jews and Christians as friends. They are friends of each other. Whoso of you makes them his friends is one of them. So God what are you if you become friends with them? You're one of them. So you're, you're just a Jew and a Christian. You're, you're a Catholic. You're a Jew and a Christian. Right? Yep. Now the word is awliya. They'll tell you, awliya doesn't mean friends. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. But finish it. What happens then? God, God, God guides not the people of the evildoers. So you're an evildoer if you befriend them. You are just like them, you see? So that's why you had ICE and Al-Qaeda. See, this is why the Muslims here, they're either dishonest or ignorant. These jihadis know their Quran and Sunnah inside and out. They're not clowns. They're mm -hmm. very educated. They know the sources, but they're not like these cowards who try to paint a rosy picture of Islam. Yeah. They know Islam. They'll quote verse uh, verse and hadith after hadith to put these people in their place. But the, they'll give me praise. No, no, they're not real Muslims. Dude, the guy is quoting dozens of Quranic ayat, dozens of hadiths, and Muslim scholars. If that means he doesn't know Islam, then there's no hope for you because you definitely don't know Islam. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, tough. but now they'll say, well, the word awliya means to take them as protectors, looking to them to protect you. Right, like mm -hmm. of government authority. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't help you for two reasons. Number one, did not Muhammad send some Muslims to seek the protection of the Christian ruler of Abyssinia, Najashi? So why, if it's forbidden to seek the help, the protection, the support of Christians and Jews, then why did Muhammad early on in the Meccan period, when he's outnumbered, send a group of Muslims to find asylum in a Christian land with a Christian ruler named Najashi. Mm. All because at that time, he was outnumbered by the unbelievers and it was a small group. So the message of Islam was different from the later message in Medina. Yep. So that shows you his inconsistency. When he's outnumbered, we can befriend Jews and Christians to help us. 
But when we have the upper hand, don't befriend them. Subjugate them. Right. But moreover, the word olia does mean friends. How do I know? Read chapter 10, verse 62. Surely God's friends, no fear shall be on them. Neither shall they sorrow. Wait, Allah has awliya. The Arabic is the same word, awliya. Now, which stupid Muslim would tell me that here it means Allah's protectors, that Allah has people who protects him? <laughs> right. Right. So that nonsense goes out the window. So the point being, if you deny the Quran is uncreated, then in an Islamic state, you are to be killed. It's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's continue. We're almost done with this section because I just want to read the scholars, right? It's not me. These are the Muslim sources, the Sunni Muslims, all right? Therefore, he who claims that the Quran is created is deemed a disbeliever as per the evidence established by all the aforementioned ayat. Now watch the source. All the scholars, not some, and exegetes specializing in jurisprudence and hadith agree by consensus, ijma, that whoever says that the Quran is created is a disbeliever. The majority of scholars also stated that whoever says that his utterance of the Quran is created is an innovator. Now you see how really weird it gets? Because there are Muslims saying, when I recite the Quran, my speech is created. They go, if you say that, you are an innovator. Bid Bida. Mm -hmm. Don't even say that. Because what they're trying to say is, when I recite the Quran, my voice is created, my speech is created, not the Quran. Don't even say that. Don't say your recitation is created. As opposed to other scholars who declare that such a person to be a disbeliever. So others even went as far as saying, you say that, you're a disbeliever. No, they said, no, that's bidah, uh, so you need to repent of it. As for those who sit on the fence, those who are undecided, those who don't know, whether should I say this guy's an innovator or a disbeliever when he says his recitation of the Quran is created. As for those who sit on the fence regarding this issue, issue, they neither state that the Quran is created, but nor do they affirm the Quran as being the word of Allah. So again, let me correct myself, referring to those who are undecided, like maybe Jake. They are classified as innovators as well. Hmm. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. Now let me tell you why this man is important. He was the imam that was thrown in prison and flogged, beaten by the Mutazilite Caliph Al-Muttim because he refused to say the Quran was created. And Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama were firm about this issue, showing no tolerance to anyone who did not take a firm position on this matter. Moreover, they abandoned those scholars who stated their utterance of the Quran is created. So any scholar who said that my recitation of the Quran is created, they abandoned him. They didn't consider him a scholar and warned people from learning from him. And also discouraged and warned people from learning or taking knowledge from them. The reason for their strong reaction and firm stance against these scholars as to close the door to ill-hearted people who would exploit such a statement in order to manipulate the Quran. This is because the utterance in this case is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it is an action performed by a person. So when you recite it, that's your action. But from another perspective, the utterance includes the Quran itself which is the word of Allah. This is why Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal told people not to visit or take knowledge from al Hussein ibn Ali al-Karabisi and forbade Dawud al-Zahiri, who had not taken a stance in this matter, from entering upon him. He dealt similarly with Yaqub al-Dawraqi and other scholars who had the same attitude. This is the reason why the author said, it is also required that the Quran is the speech of Allah. It is neither makhluk created, makhluk means created, to eventually vanish, nor the sifa attribute of something created. It's not the attribute of a thing created because it's the attribute of Allah who's uncreated, which must therefore come to an end. Yanfad. So I can read more, but did we get the point that according to Sunni Islam, the Quran is uncreated? I mean, I have a lot more. But is that clear so we can move on to other things? Yeah, that's yes, good. Okay, so if that's clear, let me now read Kadi Iyad, Musa al Yahsubi, Muhammad, Messenger of Allah, as Shifa of Kadi Iyad, translated by Aisha Buley, page 419. Look what he said. I quote He said about someone who said that the Quran is created, he is an unbeliever, so kill him. He said in the version of Ibn Nafi, he should be flogged and painfully beaten. And in prison until he repents. In the version of Bishr ibn Bakir, 
El Tenisi, we find he is killed and his repentance is not accepted. So this is who? Kadi Iyad in his book, as shifa And he says that Malik, Malik, the jurist, or I'm sorry, the Muslim scholar Malik Ibn Anas said that the one who says the Quran is created, kill him. Nafi said, no, beat him, flog him until he repents. But then Bishr ibn Baqir al-Tanisi said, kill him because his repentance is not accepted. <laughs> you see how serious this is for the wow. Sunni Muslims? Wow. Everyone getting it? Wow. You can blaspheme the Quran. To say it's created, right? Yeah. Now, this one is not a Muslim, but it's a scholar of Islam, John Alden Williams, in his book, Islam, page 179. And he, he says, I quote, The Quran is eternal. Whereas it's formed, the Arabic language in the book in which it is written is temporal. In fact, in early Islamic history, it was considered blasphemous to say that the Quran is created with the Caliph al mutawakkil around 850 AD, going so far as to, quote, decree the death penalty for anyone who taught that the word of God, i.e. the Quran, is created, unquote. Got it? Mm, mm, mm. Now, remember I said that the Sunni view of the Quran is the Trinitarian view of Jesus. Remember I said that? Yeah. And then I said that even the Mutazilites realize that? Yeah. Well, let me quote a Muslim reference. This comes from the Concise Encyclopedia of Islam, right? <clears throat> Edited by Cyril Glasse, pages 231-232. I quote, It is a fundamental doctrine of Islam that the Quran as the speech of God is eternal and uncreated in its essence and sense. Created in its letters and sounds, harf wa jar. It has been asserted that the doctrine of the uncreated Quran was the result of exposure to the Christian dogma of the Logos. Did you catch it? No. Sir Glasse, that authored and edited this Encyclopedia of Islam, says that the Sunni view that the Quran is uncreated may have been due to the Muslim exposure to the Christian understanding that Christ is the Logos that became flesh. Now let me continue. That as Christians define Jesus as the Word of God, as having two natures, one human and one divine and one person, so the Muslims transposed this doctrine by analogy to the Quran as the Word of God made book. The Muslims were indeed aware of the Christian doctrine. Now the Caliph al Ma'mun. He was the Mutazila Caliph. Here it says, died 833, who supported the Mutazilite theory that the Quran was created, wrote to one of his governors that belief in the uncreatedness of the Quran resembled the Christians when they claimed that Jesus was not created because he's the word of God. You guys are listening to this? Yeah, this is incredible. Means you guys are making a mistake by debating the Bible versus the Quran. You're making a mistake. The Sunni view of the Quran is the Christian view of Jesus. A fact admitted by scholars of Islam and the Mutazilites. Who said, you Muslims, you're no different than the Christians. All right. Okay. So let me continue. Okay. During the brief Mutazilite ascendancy, which began in the Caliphate of Al-Ma'mun, Belief in the uncreated Quran was temporarily suspended, arousing fierce opposition. The Quran was declared to be created, and those and those opposed to this view were persecuted during an inquisition called the Mihna, which lasted from 833 to 847, into the beliefs of the religious authorities. Yet lawyers and judges staunchly upheld the dogma of the uncreated Quran and nurtured it when necessary in secret. Ibn Hanbal, that's Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. Now, if, guys, if you don't know the importance of this figure, Ahmad Ibn Hanbal wrote massive volumes on hadiths. And his collection is known as Musnad Ibn Hanbal. Not only that, there's an Islamic jurisprudence named after him. You have four main Sunni schools of Islamic jurisprudence. Shafi, Maliki, Hanafi Hanbali. The Hanbali school is named after Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So 
Know who this figure is. He's important. He's not a joke. So Ibn Hanbal went further and declared that the Quran was uncreated from cover to cover. That is also in its letters and its sounds. Now watch what this authority compiling the concise encyclopedia of Islam says about Ibn Hanman's view of the Quran. In this, he was certainly not intending to imitate the Monophysites, but he was flogged for his beliefs. Now, what does that mean? The Monophysites are the group of Christians who believe that though Jesus is still man, because in heaven he's got a physical body and he's a man, they do not like to speak of two natures in Christ, what is known as diaphysitism. Instead, they speak of one nature, phusis, one nature in Christ, because they believe the human nature has been deified, undergoing what's known as theosis, engulfed by his divine nature. So they speak of one nature, though they'll say he's a man with a physical body. Right? Yeah. So what this source is saying, Glass is saying is, when Ibn, Ibn Hanbo says that the Quran is uncreated from cover to cover, his statement may lead you to think that he's even saying the book itself is uncreated. But we know the book is not uncreated. You understand the point that this author is making? Yeah. Everyone got it? I'm not going to move on. Definitely we're going to have to do a part six. There's too much meat to cover. So yeah. everyone got it? So so explain explain that part again because it, it sounded close to Gnosticism to me. Which part? The uh, part about... Uh, <clears throat> The, the, the flesh. No, that's not Gnosticism. Gnosticism would deny that the divine Christ became flesh. Oh, yeah, okay. Right? There are two strands of Gnosticism. Docetism, the view that says that Jesus appeared as a man, the mm -hmm. divine Christ appeared as a man, but he didn't have a physical body. It was a phantom body. This is why in some of those sources, Jesus walks and leaves no footprints. But then there's another strand of Gnosticism that's more akin to Nestorianism, the view that there was a divine Christ and a human Jesus, and the divine Christ entered the human Jesus at baptism, but left them at the cross. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because Gnosticism, the term coined by scholars today, described these different groups that flourished in the second, third, fourth centuries. Yeah. Right? They were influenced by Greek philosophy that said matter was evil. Yeah. And so if the Christ is divine, he wouldn't defile himself by taking on flesh. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. so either indwelt the human Jesus or appeared in a phantom body. So, this is not akin to Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Monophysitism teaches that the human nature has been deified, what is known as theosis okay. in early church belief, and it's the belief that's still prevalent among Orthodox. And it's a biblical belief, and many Christians believe it, but they don't know that they're affirming theosis. Theosis is the view that we will be, quote-unquote, deified. What does that mean? Yeah. Who the heck was that that blew my eardrums, man? Who's coming on like that, opening up their ear? Man, somebody jumped on the mic? Uh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, so I heard that, and then my ear blew. Anyway. Oh, no. Okay. Deification for the believer means you will become morally incorruptible like God, you will become physically indestructible like Christ. So in other words, you're going to share in God's God's moral incorruption, deathlessness, immortality, and you will be like Christ in his humanity and that your physical body will be indestructible. So the early church called this theosis. And they would say Christ became man so he can make man God. Not God in the sense that you be uncreated, all-powerful, present everywhere. God in the sense that you will be morally incorruptible, like God is morally incorruptible, deathless, like God is deathless, and in respect to your physical body, your physical body will be like Christ's physical body that's now deathless and destructible. And that's in the New Testament, by the way. Right? So this was called theosis. Everyone with me so far? Yep, so far. And that's in the Bible. You want me to show you the verses, guys? You want me to... Or I, I got it. I know what you're talking about. All right, then why don't you get off your horse? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, with that said, monophysites speak of one nature of Christ, Phusis. They don't like to speak of two natures because they say his humanity has been 
deified. Not that they say he's not a man, because the Coptics would come under the umbrella of monophysitism. Ask any Coptic that's here. I'm a Coptic here. Yeah, they're here. I'm monophysite and proud of it. And see, yes, and 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 yet now he's going to start a debate with the Orthodox and Catholics, and now it's going to be World War Three. But if you ask Coptic right here, this very handsome heretic, if you ask him, do you believe Jesus still has a physical body and he's a man in heaven? What is he going to tell you? Yes. There you go. Hundred percent. See, there you go. And why wouldn't I? Yeah, why but see, man, yeah, his humanity and, uh, doesn't separate from his humanity, not for a single yeah. twinkle yeah. of an eye. That's why I'm mentioning it, because people may think that when you say one nature, that you deny he's human. And that's why I wanted them to hear from the horse's mouth. That's a, I'm not calling you a horse, but, you know, that's an English expression. You know that, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank right. you, Sam. So it all comes down to terminology. And some Christians are not willing to allow another group to use specific terms without condemning as heretics. And this is why we're divided. This is why we're divided, right? And I'm not in for the division. And I will not condemn any ancient apostolic tradition. I hey, Sam, hold on a second. Your, your connection is tripping. You want to stop, dude? I got, my, um, I got my internet on. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Try, keep, keep trying to talk. All right. So, I yeah, I mean, Sam, hey, my... my so, can you hear me now? Sam, yeah, yes. sorry, Sam, to... to um, um, you know, Sophia, there, uh, in terms of the, the terminology, we got scared, Sam, because the way they spoke about the two divinities sounded like Nestorianism to us. Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. And that's why we ran away because we, you know, we said, hang on a second. I can't hear him. He's cutting up. Yeah, so that's the thing. They think it sounds Nestorian, and the other group seems, says it sounds like you're denying humanity. See, it comes down to language. And not allowing the other to use their own terms to express the same truth. And this is why the church is divided. But what yeah. Coptic, you just blew my eardrum again. Oh, my sorry, goodness. Sorry, brother. <laughs> anyway, going back to the issue of the Quran, that's what Glasse meant by saying that Im Ahmed ibn Hanbal may come off as if he's teaching monophysitism when it comes to the Quran by affirming that the book is uncreated. But that's not. This point, everyone I'm clear? clear that. Okay, I hope my connection works. Now I don't know why it says poor connection when I have my internet on. I I don't know what to do, guys. Can uh, you still you hear sound me? Sound like a robot a little bit. I don't know what's going on. Oh, you're a robot, sir. <laughs> it's better now, actually. Okay, I, there's uh, there's nothing I can do, guys, because I have the internet on. It's full blast. So if it's cutting off, we have to bear with it. So, but you guys can yep, hear me now. Hear you. Yep. Okay. With all right. Now coming back to the issue, let's finish the quote to see what Ahmed Ibn Hanbal thought. You cannot say the Quran is created. From cover to cover, it's uncreated. Now let me continue reading the source from the Concise Encyclopedia of Islam. When the Mihna came to an end, the doctrine of the uncreatedness was restored and has not been challenged since in the Sunni world. Did you guys hear it? From the ninth century onwards, the doctrine of the Quran being uncreated has been restored, and there's no one to challenge it in the Sunni world. The Karajites, Khariji, differ from the Sunnis on this point, and in their dogmas, the Quran is entirely created, which is also true for the Shia, both 12 Imam and Zaidi, whose theology in many ways is an extension of that of the Mutazilites. You guys caught it? Yes. <laughs> but now, why did I quote the concise and fight for Islam? Because here... This Muslim reference quotes the Mutazilites as saying to the Sunnis, you're no different from the Christians and what they say about Jesus being the word that became flesh. You caught it? Yeah, they even make that connection. Now let me give you another renowned authority. John L. Esposito, who is a professor of Islam, considered a scholar of Islam, who is very friendly to Islam, who has written best-selling books on Islam, and... Teaches Islamic studies at Georgetown University. And I don't know if he's retired. He may have been retired. He may have retired, but you'll find him. And here's what he says. And this comes from Islam the Straight Path, Oxford University Press, pages 71, 72. I quote The Mutazila took issue with the majority of ulama, the majority of the scholars, over the doctrines of the divine attributes or names of God and the internal, uncreated nature of the Quran. Both beliefs were seen as contradictory. And as compromising 
God's unity, Islam's absolute monotheism. Who thought the belief in the Quran being uncreated compromised the unicity of Allah? The Mutazilites. How could the one transcendent God have many divine attributes? Sight, hearing, power, knowledge, will. The Mutazilai, the Mutazilai maintain, what did they maintain? That the Quranic passages that affirmed God's attributes were meant to be understood metaphorically or allegorically, not literally. Not to do, to do so was to fall into anthropomorphism, likening Allah to human beings. That's what anthropomorphism is. Or worse, shirk, association, or polytheism. Similarly, the Islamic doctrine of the Quran is a speech or word of God should not be taken literally, for how could both God and His word be eternal and uncreated? The result would be two divinities. Who said that? The Mutazilites. The Mutazila interpreted metaphorically those Quranic statements, texts, that spoke of the Quran pre-existing in heaven. Contrary to majority opinion, they taught the Quran is the created word of God, who is its uncreated source. So far, are you with me, guys? You getting it? Yeah, this is good. Oh, it's going to get better. <laughs> the Mutazila critique of those like Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who believed in the eternity of the Quran, was ably summarized by Caliph Ma'mun in a letter to his governor. So he quotes Ma'mun again. Quote, everything apart from him, Allah, is a creature from his creation. A new thing which he has brought into existence. This perverted opinion they hold, though the Quran speaks clearly of God's created all things and proves to the exclusion of all differences of opinion, they are thus like the Christians when they claim that Isa bin Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, was not created because he was the word of God. But mm. God says, verily, we have made it. We have made it a Quran in the Arabic language. An explanation of that is, verily we have created it, just as the Quran says, and we have made from it his mate that he might dwell with her. End quote. Everyone got it? Got it. So there you go. I got a lot more citations, but I want to just quote one more. This comes from Yusuf K. Ibish, obviously a Muslim, in an article titled The Muslim Lies by the Quran, and he states, and this is cited by Kheris Wadi, the Muslim mind, page 14. Watch. Look what he says, guys. I have not yet come across a Western man who understands what the Quran is. He's talking to you, <laughs> Westerners. He's talking to you, Avery. Okay. It is not a book in the ordinary sense, nor is it comparable to the Bible. What? What did he say? Wait, wait, wait. The Quran is not comparable to the Bible, either the Old or New Testaments. It is an expression of divine will. If you want to compare it with anything in Christianity, you must compare it with Christ himself. Hmm. Christ was an expression of the divine among men, the relation of the divine will. That is what the Quran is. If you want a comparison for the role of Muhammad, the better one in that particular respect would be Mary. So Muhammad is like Mary and the Quran is like Jesus. Muhammad was the vehicle of the divine as she was the vehicle. There are Western Orientalists who have devoted their life to the study of the Quran, its text, the analysis of its words, discovering that this word is Abyssinian, that word is Greek by origin. But all of this is immaterial. In other words, it's irrelevant. The Quran was divinely inspired, then it was compiled, and what we have now is the expression of God's will among men. That is the important point. Now, did you guys hear it, you Westerners? The Muslim told you you're not getting it. The Quran is not like your Bible. The Quran is like your Jesus, and Muhammad is like your Mary. Like Mary was the vehicle that conveyed the word of God to us in flesh, Muhammad is the vehicle that conveyed the word of Allah to us as a book. Wow. Wow. So what are you guys not getting? What are you guys not getting? Mm -hmm. All right. Final one. I have to quote this one. Because this is from a renowned Muslim scholar who is part of the committee that produced the study Quran. Sayyid Hussein Nasser. Okay. In his Ideals and Realities of Islam, pages 43 to 44. The word of God in Islam is the Quran. In Christianity, it is Christ. To carry this analogy further, one can point to the fact that the Quran, being the word of God, therefore com corresponds to Christ in Christianity and the form of this book. 
which like the contents is determined by the dictum in heaven, corresponds in a sense to the body of Christ. Uh-oh. Did you catch it? This is stuff, man. This the book stuff. of the Quran, the book that is the Quran, is likened to the <laughs> flesh body of Christ. Right. Now let me continue and finish the quote. The form of the Quran, the form of the Quran, as people keep jumping on the mic, is that's what's happening? It's poor connections that's going on. Okay. The form of the Quran is the Arabic language, which religiously speaking is inseparable from the Quran, as the body of Christ is from Christ himself. Arabic is sacred in the sense that it is an integral part of the Quranic revelation, whose very sounds and utterances play a role in the ritual acts of Islam. I mean, do I need to give you more? I said final one, but you know what? Just so it can sink in, final one. This will be the final one. Another Muslim scholar, Mahmoud M. Ayyub, in speaking of Muhammad's relation to the Quran, says, quote, this comes from Islam, Faith, and History, page 41, that the words that Muhammad conveyed to his people were not his own, but were revealed to him by God. It is also understood to mean that his mind was not contaminated by human wisdom. Rather, it was a pure receptacle for the divine word in the same way that Mary's virginity means for Christians that her body was a pure vessel fit to receive Christ, the word of God. End of story. In fact, there's an interesting parallel between Christ and the Quran. Christ is, for Christians, the incarnate word of God. While the Quran is, like Christ, the eternal divine word, it does not play a role in the creation of the world. It is the eternal word of God, preserved for moral and spiritual guidance. It is an eternal book. Quote, this is surely this surely is a glorious Quran preserved in a well-guarded tablet. End quote. There you go, guys. You got it? I got it. This was clear. So now you learn, stop debating the Bible versus the Quran. Debate Jesus versus the Quran. Who or which is the true word of God? Now, from these sources, here's what we got. Let me sum it up. Just like Jesus has two natures, truly human, truly divine, the physical body of Christ, temporal, meaning it came into existence when the Holy Spirit conceived the flesh and body of our Lord from the Blessed Virgin, right? And then he became inseparable from it, right? Similarly, the Quran has two natures. One is eternal, the other temporal, because when the Quran became a book, written down in a book, the book, the kitab, which is essential and separable from the Quran, that is temporal, that is created. So the Quran, like Jesus, has two natures. And the Quran, like Jesus, has a nature that can be destroyed. Because when Uthman burned Qurans, took the Masahif, the codices of the Quran, burned them, he was destroying one part of the Quran that can be destroyed, but there's another part that can't be destroyed. So Muslim will tell you the Arabic Quran is the Quran. So when I read in Sahih Bukhari, volume 6, 5, 10, that Uthman gathered all the Arabic Qurans compiled, written down by Muhammad's companions, and burned them, he was destroying the Quran in a sense. But in another sense, they'll say he can't destroy the Quran. But hold on, isn't the Quran... A book, yes. Isn't the Arabic the Quran, the true speech of Allah? Yes. So when he destroyed the Arabic copies, wasn't that the Quran he was destroying? Yes. So does that mean the Quran vanished? It ceased to exist? No. Because though he destroyed the physical part of the Quran, there's a part of the Quran that's indestructible. That part he could not touch. Thank you for proving what we believe. That Jesus, as a man, was killed on the cross in relation to his human humanity, his physical body. But that person who is divine, who animated that body by taking to himself a human soul and human spirit, that person is indestructible and did not cease to be. And then raised that physical body back to life. So what's the problem, Muslim? If Jesus can't be truly divine and the eternal word of God... Because as a man in his flesh, he was put to death without ceasing to exist. Then you just destroyed the Quran from being eternal because the Quran was destroyed. It was burned. And there are people today, like in Sweden, a man going around burning your Arabic Quran. That means your Quran is being wiped out.
Who didn't get that? I think we all got this one, Sam. This is fun. <laughs> no more Quran versus Bible. That's pretty clear. And no more clear. saying Jesus can't be God because he died. Mm -hmm. Because then the Quran can't be eternal created because it can be destroyed, it can be burned, it can be buried. It can be published, all of that. Yeah. In fact, how many Qurans do you have? They'll say one. But how can the Quran appear in billions of books and still be one? Hmm. Plurality <laughs> within unity, anyone? Yeah. Multiplicity, diversity, and unity? Hmm. So mm -hmm. you can be one in one way, but more than one in another way? Impossible. Sounds familiar. Sure. You see, now, everyone, is it sinking in? Yeah. Once you learn this stuff, Muslims are going to avoid you like the plague. So we got it so far, right? Yeah, this is good. Oh, but we're going to make it a little worse for them. And that's we're not even going into the talking Quran and the talking chapters and the Quran appearing as a pale man yet or the surahs of the Quran appearing as flocks of birds. Boy, you think this was bad because I want to really take my time so this sinks in. Here's another problem Muslims have. They'll tell you the Quran is not Allah, but it's not other than Allah. So you ask them, what do you mean it's not Allah? Well, it's not identical to Allah. All right, so if the Quran is not identical to Allah, because Allah is not limited to the Quran, he's more than the Quran, which is why the Metazolites say you got a problem. The Metazolites say you cannot say Allah has real attributes, because if you say Allah has a plurality of attributes, and those attributes are not his essence, but distinct from the essence, you're destroying, violating his true unity. So they would say Allah doesn't have attributes, right? So the essence doesn't encompass his attributes, his, his attributes are his essence. So they would say, Allah doesn't have the attribute of knowledge. He knows. Period. End of story. Mm. Who the oh. heck is that? Who's that, man? Avery. You hear? What do you hear? <laughs> what was that, man? I just think you need to get rid of those headphones. Man, I'll bust you up, sir. Here. Oh. <laughs> Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you good. Are you, are you okay? All right, okay. Well, because I... <laughs> okay, all right. Anyway, so now if the Quran is not Allah, this is what I do. I like to set it up this way. And the Muslims are here. You got Muslims here. Let them come up. I'll entertain real answers and objections, not speeches. Because this is not Juma prayer where you give a khutbah. Okay? Okay. If the Quran is not Allah and the Quran is uncreated, and Allah is uncreated. But the Quran is not Allah. Let's do the math. One uncreated plus another uncreated, that's two uncreated entities. Mm -hmm. But they'll say, oh, but it's not other than Allah because you can't separate it from Allah. Oh, now it's going to get even worse. Mm -hmm. If you can't separate it from the Quran, that means if the Quran becomes tangible, material, and part of creation, that means a part of Allah became part of creation. Yeah. Because you can't separate the Quran from Allah, right? That's right. <laughs> so either the Quran is so distinct from Allah that when the Quran becomes a tangible material object and part of creation because it becomes a book, Allah did not become a book or a part of Allah did not become limited to creation. A part of creation did not become material tangible. Well, then you end up with two uncreated realities. But if you say, well, no, the Quran cannot be separated from Allah, then that means you have to admit that a part of Allah that's inseparable from him, from him, Entered creation, became tangible and material and bound to creation. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Which, which will it be? What is it? Which will it be? Wow. It's halal for them to say it, but it's haram for us to say it. No, they can't say it. They'll say, Billa Kaifa. Billa Kaif. Why do you think they say that? Coptic Christian. Translate Billa Kaifa for, for the audience. <laughs> Billa Kaifa, Kiani. It's, it's, not, it's not up to you, Yani. It's not... Uh, uh, I don't know how you're going to translate that, Sam, in English. It's honest. like up to Allah. It's up to him. <laughs> it's up to it's up to him. Like, it's not... It's like, shut up. Like, don't talk. Like, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Shut it's your pie hole, mister. Exactly. That's, that's the answer you're going to get. That's what yeah. it means. Up to him. 
So shut your mouth. Don't worry about it. Oh, you're invoking mystery. Mystery. But when the Christian, but when the Christian invoke mystery, you say, ha, 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 kafir, you kufar, you stupid. But you can appeal to mystery. Allahu Akbar. Allah is not bar. <laughs> right? Does that happen? Okay, so if we got all that, let's move to some further difficult questions. Things I brought up in the previous, so I won't touch them, touch on them for too long. We'll touch them so we can go into the talking, walking Quran, breathing Quran. Surat al Fatiha. That's supposed to be an uncreated speech, right? Right. But it's a prayer and it's an invocation and it's worship. So if it's uncreated and it's Allah's speech, that means it's Allah speaking. That means you Muslims are now faced with a part of Allah's speech entails Allah speaking to himself, praying to himself, praising himself, and invoking himself. You can't get around it. You can't get around it. Surah Al-Fatiha is part of his speech. When you say it's a speech of Allah, that means it's Allah speaking, not someone else, right? So Allah is speaking Surah Al-Fatiha. Allah is speaking the words of Surah Al-Fatiha, where he praises himself, prays to himself, invokes himself, and asks himself not to be angry with himself. Right? <laughs> right, that's, that's it. <laughs> so what are you going to do with that? Now, we got another problem. Open up for me, chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran, and read it. All right. Chapter 2, verse 106. Average This is going to be funny. <laughs> All right. And for whatever verse we abrogate or cast into oblivion, we bring a better or the like of it. Okay. Okay, finish it. Finish it anyway. Knowest thou not that God is powerful over everything? No, I don't know because you just baffled me. If the ayat of the Quran are all the eternal uncreated speech of Allah, right? The verses, they're all Allah's speech, right? That's right. How can Allah replace a part of his speech with a better part of his speech? That means does that mean that Allah's speech improves over time? So certain parts of the speech? Why don't you, you kafira? Why don't you, you're, you're an oda. You need to be silent, kafira. Yeah, right. You need to be silent, ya kafira. Okay, so what's my question again? All of the verses of the Quran, all the verses of the Quran are supposed to be the uncreated speech of Allah. And Allah's speech is flawless, perfect. But here it says we replace one verse with something better or similar. How can any part of Allah's speech be better than another part? The, <laughs> the questions that are that you are asking just shows you are disingenuous in your heart. That's why Allah hates me. Yes. And gee, I'm losing sleep. Oh, gee, Allah hates me. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so that's the first problem. But now, here's where I get more confused. If Allah one will replace a part of the speech with something similar, if it's similar, then why replace it at all? If it's similar enough, why don't you just stay with the original, or why don't you just go with that which is similar from the get go? Please help me out, guys. I'm not too smart. You know, I'm not a I'm not a logician or a philosopher. Can you help me out? Um. Yes. Okay, help me then, you kafir. Uh, I, I, got, I got you. I got you. So what you're missing here is that Allah reveals things in his time and in his favor. Um, that's the best I got. Hey, keep go. it up. Maybe you'll, you'll get lucky one day. Now, with all the problems of the Quran, we have another problem. And I mentioned this in the previous sessions, but I'm going to repeat it and then we're going to go into the talking, walking Quran. Okay. If the Quran is uncreated, that means all the conversations in the Quran 
all the historical events on the Quran eternally existed as a part of Allah's speech, which means as a part of Allah's knowledge. Now you're left with one of two choices. That means everything that happens in the Quran are events that have been foreordained. So when Pharaoh says what he says, that was something already determined for him in eternity because as part of Allah's speech, it's something that Pharaoh had to say once he came into being and he had to exist in order to make that part of Allah's speech a reality. Right? Right, yeah. So that means everything in the Quran was predestined. Yep. Pharaoh's rejection was predestined. Iblis's shirk was pre predestined. Adam's sin was predestined. All of this was predestined because these speeches, these events are part of Allah's speech. Allah's speech is uncreated, has no beginning. So all of these events had to inevitably take place. So these individuals were created to <clears throat> pretty much follow the script that was already written before for them before they existed and they had no choice. So much for the free choice. Or if you're going to affirm free will, now you have a worse dilemma. What could be worse? If man has free will, that means you're going to have to argue that all of those speeches and events that are part of Allah's uncreated speech, they are not predestined, but Allah foreknowing what these <clears throat> individuals would do in those circumstances. <clears throat> He foreknew that, and therefore, it's part of his eternal speech, which then you need to explain how then can he foreknow something that is part of a speech that's always existed. So logically, what comes first, and then talk about brain damage. But put that aside. <laughs> right. I was like, man, what? The yeah, I mean, because which, okay, hold on. Wait, so he foreknew? What does he foreknow? That they would say these things, but the things they say are part of his speech, and his speech is uncreated. So how can a speech be impacted, influenced, shaped, and formed by the speeches of creatures that do not exist? Right. The second problem is these individuals had to necessarily exist. Allah was not free not to create them because if he did not create them, that means those aspects of the speech would never become a reality and they'd be falsified. So Allah is not free to create whom he wills. Tawheed, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone got it? Got it. I got to make sure everyone else is getting it. In other words, let me repeat it again. If these individuals were not predestined to do and say what they did, that means the speeches of Pharaoh and the disbelievers and Satan, though not predestined, had a direct impact and shaped the way Allah would come out speaking, even though his speech is supposed to be uncreated. So Allah's speech is dependent on creatures. And so he wasn't free to say what he wanted to say because his speech had to say exactly what he foresaw his creatures would say. Which means he was not free not to create them because if he didn't create Iblis or Pharaoh to say and do what they did, then those parts of his speech would be proven false and would never be realized. So Allah needed them. And wasn't free not to create them. I don't want to move on until you guys got it, man. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Yeah. Or we say Billa Kaif, right? Billa Kaifa, you kafir. Oh, no. <laughs> it's no, funny. Now, before I move on, are you seeing the huge embarrassment problems of Islam? Yeah. And it's it's no way around it, like literally no way around it. Like I'm trying my best to put myself in their shoes and think like, how could we, you know, you think your way out of this, but there's nothing. You can't do it. Yeah. You got to just say, Allahu Allahu'alam. That's it. Allah knows. Yeah. It's up to um, him. 
it's funny too because the it when when uh sam when you're done with your next point i well uh, i thought you know since we're on this topic and it's funny when you mention like the aspect of the quran being created because saint john of damascus brings up this argument towards the muslims and saint john of damascus was around during the time of islam's yep, uh, infancy syria. yeah syria exactly and you see how islam is so easy to destroy because it's the most obviously Muhammad is the most obviously false prophet that you could point to. And Islam is, well, again, I don't know because I don't know much about Hinduism. So I got to be careful because I've been told Hinduism is just as bad or just as immoral, just as stupid. I don't know. I haven't studied Hinduism. From all the religions I've seen, I would say Islam and Mormonism are the most stupidest, irrational, brain damaging cults in the world today. The more you study them, the stupider you become. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, Billa Kefa, we're not allowed to use our brains. It's it's haram That's to right. use Billa our Kefa, brains. man. All right, now let's go into the talking Quran. The talking Quran, baby. Are we ready? Yeah. Now this comes from that section uh, where I'm responding to Uthman ibn Farooq. So all the material is going to be in that link. I gave it to you already. Let me share it in the YouTube. And so we're just going to be reading and then we'll sum up. But we do need to do a section on the Ruh and we'll be done. That's it. Now you've got too much ammunition. You got these sessions now archived. You got the articles with all the quotations there. What more do you want to do your job in destroying Islam for the glory of Jesus Christ so we can see Muslims get saved and persecuted Christians be spared from the onslaught? <clears throat> You guys just heard recently what they did to a precious sister of ours in Nigeria, a beautiful young evangelical Christian sister, love with the Lord. The Muslims lied about what she said on WhatsApp, beat her to death and burned her corpse. This is Islam. We need to do our part not to fear their threats, but to destroy this cancer and keep Muhammad buried and dead in hell by the power of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, Islam is going to spread like cancer and do more damage to more lives until the Lord Jesus returns. You with me there? Amen, So, So let's do our part. and Let's not be afraid. If you really believe Christ is risen, what did Jesus say in Matthew 10, 28? Do not fear him who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Indeed, Rather, fear the one who can destroy risen. both soul and body in Gehenna, right? That's right. Only God can destroy me, both body and soul, either wipe me out or punish me with everlasting destruction. The worst they can do is destroy my body, but then God will resurrect my body and my soul will be alive in the presence of Jesus until then. If we believe, and we're not just lip service, right? So with that said, let's quote the Hadith. The walk and talk in Quran, baby. There we go. Now, I so also we... quote Muslim authorities that say Muhammad believed everything will be manifest. Everything will come to life and be endowed with speech, literally, even fasting. In fact, there's a tradition that says even death will appear as an animal and be cut in half as a sign that death has been abolished. Muhammad actually thought, and I have an article on this, I'm going to have to get it for you, that everything had rationality cognition or the potential for being <clears throat> aware self-awareness for example in one of the previous sessions we went through the black stone coming to did we talk about the black stone no we did not we oh and then the we got to do a part six sinner <laughs> all right black part six the black stone and the rule why well, and because i did a session the black stone will be given eyes and a tongue to speak muhammad actually thought everything will be given awareness everything it wasn't metaphorical. Even fasting would appear visibly to defend you. That's the logic of Muhammad. Now here, Sai Muslim, book four, number 1757. Sai Muslim, book four, number 1757. Abu Umama, by the way, in Arabic, Abu Umama, translating means the father of your mama. Did you guys know that? The father of your mama? <laughs> Took a while, man. Come on. No, it doesn't mean that, man. I'm lying. All right. Abu Umama <laughs> said he heard Allah's messenger say, recite the Quran for on the day of resurrection, it will come as an intercessor for those who recite it. 
Now recite the two bright ones, Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran. Why? Chapters 2 and 3. For on the day of resurrection, they will come. Chapters 2 and 3. They will come as two clouds or two shades or two flocks of birds in ranks, pleading for those who recite them. Recite Surah Al-Baqarah, for to take recourse to it is a blessing, and to give it up is a cause of grief, and the magicians cannot confront it. Muawiyah said, it has been conveyed to me that here, batala means magicians. Now, did you catch it before I move on to other hadith? Yep, two chapters of the Quran yes. are going to come like birds or whatever. Yeah, so notice, not only does the Quran come to life and will defend you, chapters of the Quran will appear separately from one another. Specifically, chapter 2 and 3, they'll appear separately from the Quran and from one another and appear visibly either as flocks of birds or shades and will come speaking and argue with Allah on the behalf of those that recited it. That means the Quran consists, the present Quran consists of 114 living, conscious, self-aware beings that can speak and communicate and will be speaking and defending and communicating on behalf of those that recited the Quran before Allah. Which means that the chapters of the Quran must be omniscient because they must know all those that recited it and how many times they recited it. Whoa. Yeah, you got they it came or no? all at different times, Sam. Yes. They're omnipresent and they all came at different times. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. That's right, Subhanallah. Now here. This comes from Jami Tirmidhi. It's great. Hassan. Jami, and this is all on Sunnah.com. Book 45, Hadith 3164. In English, it's volume 5, book 42. Hadith 2915. Chapters on the virtues of the Quran. <clears throat> Narrated Abu Huraira. That the Prophet said, the one who memorized the Quran shall come on the day of judgment and <clears throat> the reward of re for reciting Quran. That's not in the Arabic. And it will say, O Lord, decorate him. Who will say that? The Quran. So the, the Quran knows Allah is the Lord, and the Quran knows that it's not Allah, but it's different from Allah. And the Quran knows the person that recited it, so will ask Allah to de decorate that person. So he's done <clears throat> with the crown of nobility. Then it says, O Lord, give him more. So he's done with a suit of nob nobility. Then it says, O Lord, be pleased with him. So he's pleased with him, says, recite and rise up and be increased in reward with every ayah. Here's another one. This is, again, same Jami Tirmidhi, but a different English translation of Jami Tirmidhi, this time found on alam.org, which I've linked to. Hadith number 1963. By Haqqi transmitted it in Shuab al-Iman. Narin Abdullah bin Amr. Okay. Allah's Messenger said, Fasting and the Quran intercede for a man. Fasting says, O oh my Lord, I have kept him away from his food and his passions by day, so accept my intercession from So even fasting will come to life and be aware of those that fasted. The Quran says, I have kept him away from sleep by night, so accept my intercession from him. Now, how does the Quran know how many people stayed up at night reciting it so that now it can go before Allah on their behalf? Because it's all-knowing. And it's from... Tirmidhi, not in the Da'if hadith, brother. Da'if? No, brother. Stuck for Allah, get stuck for Allah. Now, in reports, now what I'm about to quote you, are reports classified as Hassan. Don't let that clown tell you otherwise. Da'if. Hassan. Muhammad is said to have believed that the Quran will appear as a man. This is the hadith that he said. Oh, it's Da'if, brother, according to Al-Albani. Really? All right. Let's see. It was narrated that Buraida said, I heard the prophet say, the Quran will meet its companion on the day of resurrection when his grave is open for him in the form of a pale man. It will say to him, do you recognize me? He will say, I do not recognize you. Now, do you blame it? All his life, he saw the Quran as a book, a mushaf, a kitab, right? Now, here's this pale looking dude, a white dude. Notice, if you're good, you're pale. If you're bad, you're black. Right? Muhammad had right. a dream of a black woman. He said that's a sign of ep epidemic breaking out among the Muslims. Muhammad said an Ethiopian with skinny legs, a black man, will destroy the Kaaba. 
a tradition attributed to Muhammad said that Muhammad, that Allah, when he created Adam, stroked the left shoulder and descendants that looked like black ants came out and he says, to hell and I don't care. Mm -hmm. But then he stroked his right shoulder and descendants came out looking like white ants and, for, and he said, for <clears throat> paradise and I don't care. What is it with Muhammad that everything black is evil to the extent that in Kadi <clears throat> Iyad, in his book Shifa, he quotes a Muslim who says that if you say Muhammad is black, you are to be killed. Mm -hmm. What's up with Muhammad, dude? Can you explain that to me? He's a racist white slave trader. And did you know what chapter 3 verse 108 says? On the day of resurrection, those with white faces will enter paradise. Those with black faces will go to hell. Mm -hmm. Open up for me, can you? 3108 to read it so you guys don't think I'm lying. Yeah, because you just sound like an Islamophobe at this point, Sam. Man, why don't you stop the hate, bro? Man, we're about to expose you right now when we read I'm a Islam Islamophilia, meaning I love Islam. Not. 108. Yep. About to expose you right now. There's no please way. put me in my place. Chapter 3, verse 108. That's right, sir. Don't hate, appreciate. All right, this is the Arbery translation. These are the signs of God we recite to thee in truth, and God desires not any injustice to living beings. Chapter 3, verse 108. Well, one second, sir. I may, maybe I had a computer shutdown. Is it okay? I can have a shutdown. What else does it say? That's all it said. It's Let me just double check, sir. Ya kafir, ya kufar, ya munafik. <laughs> Hold on, sir. You're supposed to know all the verses. Oh, yeah, 3106, right. sir. You hate her, bro. Uh, uh, because in the older Qurans, they had different versifications. Uh, 50, 551 was 555. There's only one Quran, Sam. 3106, you little hater. Don't hate, participate. Okay, this is what it says then. Let's see. Let's see if you're truthful. And then also 107. Read it with 107. 3106, 107. Okay, I'll read it with 107 then. Make up your mind, man. Come on. Well, I just want to give you a brownie point. Read, one, read 106, 107. All right. All right, so it says, The day when some faces are blackened and some faces are whitened. What? As, yeah. As for those whose faces are black, did you disbelieve after you had believed? Yusuf Ali actually captures the Arabic even better. On the day when some faces will be white and some faces will be black. Yeah. To those whose faces will be black, did you reject faith after accepting it? What about those faces who are white? But as for those whose faces are white, they shall be in God's mercy. They're in dwelling forever. Now let's say, oh, come on, man. There are, there are black Muslims who will be saved. Yeah, but stupid, you don't get it. The black person is going to be turned into white. Yeah. In other words, all the black Muslims who are good, they'll no longer be black. They're going to be white in paradise. Yeah. Because Allah only, Allah only wants white people in paradise. Morons. That's what the verse is saying. But if you are, let's say, a white man and you're evil, you're going to be turned into a black man and thrown into hell. Yeah. You guys awesome. got it? Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> so white and black will make it to paradise. They're all going to look white. You're going to be a white dude. White and black who are disbelievers go to hell, they'll all be turned black. You're going to be black. Alhamdulillah. And yeah, let alone the Hadith where it says Muhammad owned black slaves and sold black slaves. slaves yeah. And Bukhari and Muslim and other Hadiths. Yep. Yeah. It says, and even says, the black slave of Allah's messenger. And Allah's messenger sold black slaves. It says black. I challenge you Christian, I'm not you Christian, I'm sorry. I challenge you Muslims, show me a single verse in the Bible where it mentions the color of anyone, especially of slaves. Mm -hmm. Show me where it says, and those black slaves are... The Bible nowhere identifies someone by their skin, the color of their skin. It's your wicked prophet that does so. Bella case. And Solomon Pope still don't get it. Solomon Pope, you're making my case. The glory of Allah turns them into white people, whereas the wrath of Allah turns them into black people. You're making my case. 
So now with that said, let's move on to the point we're making. So the Quran appears as a pale man. And what is it going to say? It will say, do you recognize me? He will say, I do not recognize you. Of course I don't, man. All of my life I saw you as a book. Who the hell are you? It will say, I am your companion, the Quran. Really? <laughs> it's you? <sighs> Who kept you thirsty on hot days and kept you awake at night. Every merchant benefits from his business, and today you will benefit from your good deeds. Now, I'm really confused. I thought the Quran itself consists of chapters where we hear the uh, speech of Allah, right? That's right. How is it that the Quran now is speaking words not found in the Quran? It's having a conversation. You caught it? I caught it. You guys see the conversation that the Quran is having? Hey, you remember me? <laughs> Kept you up at night. Sucks being you. And it's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be other than Allah, right? Yeah, because now watch what it's going to do. Watch what it's going to do now. Every merchant benefits from his business, and today you'll benefit from your good deeds. He'll be given dominion in his right hand and turn his left, and there will be placed on his head a crown of dignity. And his parents will be clothed with priceless garments, the like of which have never been seen in this world. They will say, why have we been clothed with this? It will be said, because your son used to recite Quran who's now his white friend, his white buddy. Then it will be said to him, recite and ascend in degrees of paradise. And he will continue to ascend so long as he recites, either at a fast pace or a slow pace. Now, remember I said the grading is Hassan? Now, yeah. this comes from Islam Q&A, Islam question and answer. They cite this and give the grading. Narrated by Ahmad in Al-Musnad, that's Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Ibn Majah in Al-Sunan, classed as Hassan, not Taif, by Al-Busayri and Al-Zawaid, and by Al Albani and Al Silsila Al Sahiha. So, why did that slob lie and say, no, Al Bani said it's Zaif? Yeah, he said it's Zaif if you quote this, it's not, but from another chain, it's Hassan. Everyone got it? So, he's saying, so uh, uh, somebody says that it's weak, somebody else says that it's good? No. What I'm saying is that even Al Albani, whom he cited as saying it's naif, he didn't quote the full citation. He goes, from this route, it's naif, but from this other route, it becomes Hassan. Ah, I see. That's why Islam question and answer said, classed as Hassan by who? Al Busayri and Al Zawa'id and by Al Albani. Yeah. Al Silsila Al Sahiha, number 2829. Very good, very good. Very good. And remember, he's a scholar. He's got the books, right? <laughs> yeah. Supposedly. So did Mr. Scholar see that in his book? He yeah, probably saw the footnote. All right. Oh, yeah, that's right. The footnote where it says there's many messiahs, dude. They're all rasuls, dude. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now with that said, let's continue. There's an only. Now, in that article, I also quote from <clears throat> Ibn Majah, the one that he said, well, you know, that's Daif. And it's found on sunnah.com. Right, and even the grading here, which we try to show, well, he still rejected it. It's Hassan. It says Hassan. It was narrated from Ibn Buraida that his father told that the Messenger of Allah said, "The Quran will come in the day of resurrection like a pale man, and will say, I am the one that kept you awake at night and made you thirsty during the day.' Hassan. All right, let's forget that. Now here's where it's going to get really bad for our friend, Mishkat al-Masabi. I'm almost done with this session. Mishkat al-Masabi, English translation with explanatory notes by Dr. James Robson. And I'm quoting volume two, page 459, but it's also on sunnah.com, number 2176. It's there. I give you the link in the article. Watch here, guys. The Quran is called the Savior, the Deliverer, the Rescuer. Watch. Khalid bin Madan said, recite the Rescuer. Recite the one who rescues you. The one who rescues you? You mean like save me? Deliver me? But save me from what? Which is... ALM, Alif Lam Mim, the sending down, chapter 32 of the Quran. You guys caught it? Incredible, yeah. <laughs> so, chapter 32 of the Quran is called Rescuer, the Reciter. You guys catching it? The Rescuer, yeah. the Reciter. Okay, now watch here. Now, one thing, uh, is your YouTube channel working? It's okay? Because I was there. It looks like it was buffering. Y'all let me know. Is the uh, YouTube channel good? Because it's good on my end. 
Okay, good. All right, good. Praise God. I just want to make sure. Okay, so now chapter 32. Why? Why should you recite it? For I have heard that a man who had committed many sins used to recite it and nothing else. It spread its wings over him. Wait, chapter 32 has wings? <laughs> and said, my Lord, Rabbi. So wait, chapter 32, Allah speech, speaks to Allah and calls Allah, my Lord. Forgive him for he often used to recite me. Again, I'm, uh, uh, Avery, help me understand. I'm a little confused. Yeah. I thought the Quran is Allah's speech, so it's Allah speaking. Listen. So how can Allah's speech speak to Allah and say to Allah, you are my Lord and forgive him because you recite me? Yes. <clears throat> I Listen, the word of Allah is in Allah also distinct from Allah. Okay, but dude, I thought it's Allah speaking. Yes, but you you you, you got to let that go a little bit because you're not <laughs> thinking about Allah's nature. Bella Kefa, brother, it's mystery, Kafir. <laughs> so either we have Allah speaking to himself in a different mode, uh -huh. so this is modalism, or the Quran, it consists of 114 distinct, separate, divine persons if not beings all of whom can speak to one another and appear visibly and speak to allah and worship allah as their very lord because notice it says to allah my lord yeah yeah so yeah. the lord most high made it an intercessor for him so that notice it got allah to do what it wanted him to do okay i'll make you an intercessor to make you happy happy now and then said, record from a good deed and raise him a degree in place of every sin. Now watch here. It gets worse. For the Muslims, better for us. Khalid said, it will dispute. Wait. Chapter 32 will argue and fight with Allah? It will dispute on behalf of the one who recites it when he is in the grave saying, oh God. Oh, so a chapter of the Quran calls Allah, Lord and Allah. If I am a part of thy book, Make me an intercessor for him. So wait, the chapter is aware it's part of the kitab? Wow. And says to Allah, if I am, make me an intercessor. But if I'm not part of thy book, blot me out of it. So wipe me out if you're not going to do what I tell you to do. If you're not going to listen to me and forgive him. Wipe me out. I want to have nothing to do with you, Allah. And I want to have nothing to do with your book. It will be like a bird putting its wing on him. It will seed for him. And will protect him from the punishment in the grave. He said the same about another chapter. Blessed is he. Which is chapter. Actually 67 of the Quran. So chapter 32 and 67. Both of them will appear as birds with wings. Both of them will argue with Allah. Demand Allah do what they want Allah to do. Or they're going to demand wipe us out. And Allah will then acquiesce and give them their demands. Because he can't wipe them up because they're part of his book and part of his speech. So we got chapter 2, chapter 3. Chapter 32. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Earlier. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, earlier. We got chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 32, and, and 67. 67, appearing as birds, uh, interceding, talking, disputing with Allah, and saying, if I'm not a part of the book, wipe me out. Yep. If you want. <laughs> now, here's here's what I want you also, to compare the statement of these surahs. Notice what they said. It says, what they say to Allah, it says, here, let me read. If I'm part of thy book, make me an intercessor for him. But if not part of thy book, blot me out of it. Here, Muhammad stole the words of Moses. Read Exodus 32, verses 32 to 33. Hold on. Now, now, he stole the words of Moses. Now, now we're getting interesting. Now we're going to the good book now. Hold on, let me get there. <clears throat> you mean to tell me that he stole the words of yep. Prophet Musa? You got it. Alayhi <laughs> salam. And what, what chapter was this again? Chapter 32 of Exodus, verses 32-33. Exodus 32. 33. All right. Okay, so it says, <laughs> But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever 
has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. 32 to 33, loser. You were at 33. Exodus oh, 32, shoot. 32, 33. And I you're a loser. You lost your weight up since. So I be proud. I did. Wow. Look, man, you've been blowing my brain cells trying to have me fix Tawheed, man. It's all right, brother. This is your brain on Islam. <laughs> Chapter 32, <laughs> verses 32, 33. You read God's yeah. response. Yeah, but you are a loser. And take it I positive because you lost your weight of sin. You, you, I'll take it this time. I'll take the L this No, time. but you lost your burn of sin, so it's good. You're a loser. You <laughs> lost your sin. Man, dude, hater, bro. Look, this is what he says. <clears throat> <clears throat> but now, if you will forgive their sin... But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Ah, I see now. But so where did Muhammad the take the words and put in the mouth of these surahs, 32 he, and 67? Yes, he literally took Moses' words right out from the book. But here's what's wow. ironic. No one denies Moses is a living, rational being, right? Correct. So for chapter 32 and 67 to utter the same words of Moses, that means they must be living, rational beings too. Correct. So now you have the individual of chapters of the Quran. Each chapter is living, wow. conscious, and aware. Each of them can appear separately in visible forms. So the Quran is not one <clears throat> conscious, self-aware entity. It consists of 114 living, rational, self-aware beings who realize they're distinct from one another, realize they're distinct from Allah, realize they're all part of Allah's book, and can argue with Allah and make Allah do what they want. Mic drop. You got it now? Yeah, wow. that's that's crazy. That was now, before. let me end it with this citation from Islam Q&A, Q question and answer. This is a prominent, renowned Salafi website. Even Uthman swears by it. Don't let him lie to you. Oh no, yeah, because this is what he wanted. This is the website he copied and pasted, and as if it was one of the books okay. that he was reading. Because why? I'm going to show you. Because here, this comes from Islam question and answer, question 1960, 54. Will the Quran testify in the day of resurrection? I link to it in the, in the post. Guys, I don't need to remind you. Take all my materials, upload them, translate them, clip them, provided you ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand the arguments correctly and pass them on correctly, please. Because here is what they're going to say. Watch here. Because they're going to quote Bukhari in an interesting <clears throat> statement. It was narrated by Ibn Abi Shayba in Al Musannaf, Ibn Qutayba in Ta'wil, Mukhtalaf, Mukhtalaf al Hadith, Ibn at Duras in Fada'il al Quran, via Muhammad ibn Ishaq from Amr ibn Shu'ayb from his father, that his grandfather said, I heard the Messenger of Allah say, the Quran will appear on the day of resurrection in the form of a man who will bring the man who learned it but went against its commands. It will appear as a disputant against him and will say, O oh Lord, so the Quran is speaking as a man, O oh Lord, you made him learn about me, but what a bad learner he was. He transgressed my limits, neglected my obligations, disobeyed me and did not obey me. It will keep throwing accusations on, at him until it is said, do you do what you like with him? So notice, Allah is saying to the Quran, do with him as you deem fit. Do what you want with him. Then it will take him by the hand. The Quran will take the guy by the hand and will let him go until it throws him onto a rock in hell. The Quran is going to take this guy that disobeyed the Quran and throw him in hell. And it will bring a righteous man who learned it and adhered to its teachings. It will appear as a defendant and will say, Oh Lord, you made him learn about me and what a good learner he was. He respected my limits, did the obligatory duties, avoided the sins mentioned in me, and obeyed my instructions. And it will keep presenting arguments in his favor until it said, do what you like with him. So Allah is saying to the Quran, do what you want with him. Then it, the Quran, will take him by the hand and will not let him go until it addresses him in brocade and puts on him the crown of a king. Now, he's going to catch me here. Ah, but hold on, you kafir. This is a da'if isnat. It's weak. Because Ibn Ishaq is mudallis and used the word an, narrating from i.e. He did not state clearly that he heard it directly. Ah, but here. Wait, 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 wait. But Al-Bukhari said, wait, who? But Al-Bukhari said in his book, Khalq Afal Al-Ibad, Abdullah ibn Amr narrated that from the Prophet, the Quran will appear in the form of a man and the day of resurrection will intercede for its companions in your face. So though Ibn Ishaq is considered mudallis, 
weakening the deed. But Bukhari then quotes a similar hadith in Khaliq al Afal al Ibad, number 474. Then we go on and see what it says. Zuhair ibn Harb said, told me, Yaqub ibn Ibrahim told us, my father told me from Ibn Ishaq and Amr ibn Shuayb, Ibn Muhammad, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Amr told me from his father, <clears throat> from his grandfather. I heard this from the Prophet. Abu Abdullah al Bukhari said, this is his earnings and his deeds, end quote. So it is proven that Ibn Ishaq heard the hadith from Amr ibn Shuayt. Thus, the hadith is proven. Let me repeat it twice. So it is proven that Ibn Ishaq heard the hadith from Amr ibn Shuayt. Thus, the hadith is proven. Did you catch it? Everyone got it? You got it, Sam. You got, and you got Allah. Yep. Now let me finish it. The words the Quran will appear on their resurrection means that his rotation of the Quran will appear to him. No, that's ta we are there allegorizing. That's not what it means. It was narrated by Ibn Abi Shaiba and Ad Darimi, Darimi, and from Ash Shabi, from Ibn Masood, that's Muhammad's companion, who said, The Quran will come. This is Abdullah Ibn Masood, one of the four men that Muhammad said learned the Quran from. The Quran will come on the day of resurrection and will intercede for its companion. And it will lead him to paradise. Or it will testify against the person. It will drive him to hell. So the Quran will bring you to paradise or damn you to hell. As Shabi did not hear from Ibn Masood, as it says in Al-Marasil Marasil by Ibn Abi Hatim. But there is a corroborating report that says the Quran is an intercessor whose intercession will be accepted, an opponent whose testimony will be accepted. Whoever puts it in front of him, it will lead him to paradise. Whoever puts it behind his back, it will drive him to hell. This was narrated via a number of isnads from Ibn Masood. See, Fada'al al-Quran by al-Faryabi, Fada'al al-Quran by Abu Ubaid, Fada'al al-Quran by Ibn Durais, Az-Zuhd by Ibn Ahmad, Shu'ib al-Iman by al-Bayhaqi, al-Mujam al-Kabir by al-Tabarani. From the above, quote, from the above, it is clear that just as the Quran will testify for its companions on the date of resurrection, it will also testify against those who went against it. It is clear. Where did I get this from? Islam question and answer. Question 1960-54. Will the Quran testify on the day of resurrection? What do they say? Yes. Because there are sound narrations that say so. Can I end it now with one more and we're done? Yes. This comes from Sebastian Gunther. Roads to Paradise, Eschatology and Concepts of the Year After in Islam, two volumes. Volume 1, page 207. And this is his section, The Poetics of Islamic Eschatology, Narrative, Personification, Colors, and Muslim Discourse. I quote, and he's going to quote Muslim scholars. The great wonders of the Day of Judgment continue as everything and every concept existing on earth appears in human form. Did you hear that? He's quoting authentic Islamic sources and scholars saying everything will appear in human form. The Quran appears as a man with a beautiful face and figure. Similarly, the Islamic religion, even the religion, deen itself emerges as a person. An ideal somewhat resembling Dana, the female personification of the visionary soul who guides the deceased along a narrow path to the other world in Zoroastrianism. The world comes into sight as a hoary old woman. Now, he's quoting authentic sources and Muslim scholars that say this. Even the world itself will appear as a hoary woman. And people are told, this is the world over which you used to envy and hate each other. Likewise, Friday, dude, even Friday, <laughs> the day of the Muslim communion prayer approaches in the image of a bride being led in processions as lovely as can be. I'm not lying. Now, watch here, though. Al-Ghazali, <sighs> Hamza Yusuf swears by Al-Ghazali. He loves Al-Ghazali. A lot of Ashari and Maturidi Muslims, they love Al-Ghazali, but the Salafis despise him. Al-Ghazali emphasizes that these personifications, things, and ideas are to be understood literally. Let me repeat it twice. Al-Ghazali, considered one of the greatest Sunni Muslim scholars, loved and adored by Ashari's Maturidis, disliked by Ibn Taymiyyah and Salafis. What did he say? Al-Ghazali emphasizes that these personifications of things and ideas are to be understood literally. One more time. Are to be understood literally. 
even though acceptance, acceptance of such an understanding and the here now may be difficult. He insists that these personifications are not merely symbolic. I repeat, not merely symbolic and explains that with their physical representation in the material world, expressions such as earth, Islam, the Quran, prayer, fasting, and patience refer to real and solid things. While their innermost nature, they belong to the spiritual world. Therefore, the Quran exists, quote, as a person, unquote. And Islam, quote, as something spiritual, unquote, through the will of Almighty God. What did Ghazali say? The Quran exists as a person. Whosoever recognizes this truth will encourage a literal understanding of the scripture and a spiritual approach to the world. This is why literalists would never speak of the creation of the Quran as a rational sect of the Jahmi does, does. The author of the Precious Pearl maintains that the Jahmis, a heretical sect of Islam, apparently a derogatory or code word for Mutazilis, are ignorant of the spiritual reality of existence and in error when they argue the soul is annihilated at death. End quote. There you go. This is beautiful. So what do we learn? The Quran consists of 114 eternal, uncreated, living, self-aware, rational, divine beings who are all aware that they exist, <clears throat> all aware that others exist, all aware they exist as, as the book of Allah, all aware that they're distinct from Allah, all of which can appear in visible form and shape, either as clouds or shades or flocks of birds, who will then argue with Allah, dispute with Allah, and make Allah accept their intercession for all those that recite the Quran, which means they must be omniscient because they must know all those that recite the Quran from those who don't. Here you go. So we have a plurality within Allah's nature or two things that are eternal. Not two, 115 things. 115 each things. chapter is a living rational being. The Quran is not one. It's a multiplicity of beings or persons. Yes. Compiled into a, a, a convoluted book, essentially, or yep. one convoluted book with contradictions. So you have either 114 divine eternal beings or the one Allah exists eternally as 115 divine persons that can okay. argue with one another and fight with one another and appear separately from one another in visible form. And oh, but the Trinity is pagan, right? <laughs> exactly. And so there you go, guys. We're done with this session. But don't out. forget, brother, remind me in part six to talk about the black stone and the soul, the spirit. Yeah. Because we had to top it off with that. Yes, I will. So that's it, man. You got it. Yeah, this was this was excellent, guys. I hope you all enjoyed this one, man. This was uh <laughs> this was good. Going deep into the Quran. Oh, my gosh. Sammy you got Sophie. over 300 people again, 264 I see here, and then 60, and you're, man, dude, you, you're famous, bro. Oh, man, glory to the most high God. We, we, you know we are. Don't forget when you take off and you make the money, you know, I'm a squirrel. <laughs> Give me an up, bro. <laughs> I'll take care of you, Sam. All right, bro. So, guys, that's it for Wait. this session. You got the articles. All the quotations are there, accurately cited, links to the actual Muslim websites. Mm -hmm. I've done my part by the grace of God's spirit, putting my heart to do my part. You need to do your part. Study the arguments, understand them. I've caught Christians misrepresenting the actual argument and embarrassing themselves. You owe it to the Lord to be studious, to understand what you see, hear, and read, and then pass that on accurately, and you can upload my stuff. But share it freely. Now, if they want to give you a love offering, amen. The labor is worthy of his wages, but don't demand it. So there you go. Amen. Hey Sam, Sam you, you got you got you got time for a question, Sam? Of course, my friend. If there's few people have questions, I'll take some questions. Go ahead. Thank you, brother. Um, you started with um, uh, stating about Quran only um, Muslims. I've done a bit of study into that, and the majority of the Muslim scholars reject Quran only Muslims that they are actually Kafirs. Yeah, they but they don't care. That's yeah, the thing. Uh, the Quran only don't care. They don't care, though. Right. So I'm losing. No, I'm losing you, your sound. Care. I'm losing your sound, buddy. You got to come closer to the mic. 
Hello? Yeah, um, I'm not a very good mic, unfortunately. Okay, I'm hearing I, I, you a little bit, yeah. So, yeah, I know the majority of Muslims, Shia and Sunni, would all condemn them, but they don't really care. They go, prove it from the Quran. But the Quran does say they have to obey and follow Muhammad. They'll say, yeah, what Muhammad gave us in the Quran. Okay, okay. That's the whole point. And you know what's ironic? They're in a dilemma because the Quran does say the Quran doesn't eat anything. The Quran explains everything in detail and explains its verses in details, but that's a lie. It doesn't. And so damn if you do, damn if you don't. If you stick with the Quran, you're damned because you can't make sense out of it. But if you go outside of the Quran to the Hadith, you're damned because then that contradicts the Quran. Mr. Sam, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, a little louder if I can hear you. Uh, uh, my question is, they then Islam says Muhammad doesn't know how to read and write. No, in actually, the, first, the Quran doesn't. You're saying the Quran, the Quran doesn't say that. Islam made you say that, yeah. Yeah, okay, but in the first ayah says, read, 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 and he says, I'm not reading. So is it yeah. God knows that you know, he knows yeah. how to read? Don't oh, confuse two know. issues, brother. You're all over the map. You confuse two issues. In the Hadith, Happy. it does say, you know, I cannot read. But the verse itself, chapter 96, says read. But the Quran itself does not say Muhammad is illiterate. But Islam, they say he's illiterate. He doesn't yes, know right. how to read or write. Yep. They would say that. But that's what I'm saying. In Islamic tradition, they made him illiterate. And therefore, when the Gabriel comes and says read, he says, I don't know how to read. Now, there you got a problem. Let me tell you what the problem is. Some traditions say Gabriel showed up and told them Iqra. Now, Iqra means read, but they use it to mean recite. I'm not going to split hairs on that. The problem is if if Gabriel appears... My question, my question. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off. Recite, what that mean if I tell you to recite something? No, but that's my point. You, you didn't hear what I read. said. Brother, yes. you didn't hear what I said. If you're going to pretend to be wanting an answer, then listen. Iqra can mean read or recite, even in chapter 96, because it talks about read, your Lord who taught by the pen. So listen a little better so I can help you make your argument stronger. So the debate is, does Iqra mean recite or read? So let me help you make your argument stronger. Listen now. Are you listening? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. If we go with recite, then it's stupid for mama to say, I don't know how to recite because even a five-year-old can recite, right? So if Iqra means recite and mama says, I don't know to recite, then that means what a stupid response. Even a five-year-old can recite, correct? Correct, correct. So why would he say, I don't know how to recite? So then some traditionists got smart. So they say Gabriel came with silk brocade with writing on it. This is found in Tabri and Ibn Kathir. So actually Gabriel came with a piece of writing. And so he said, read. And Muhammad said, I don't know how to read. But if you go with Bukhari, it says that the spirit came, later identifies Gabriel, and just told him, Iqra. But it doesn't say he came with writing. In Tabari, Ibn Kathir, it says when Gabriel came, the spirit, later identified Gabriel, he came with a piece of writing. So that's why Muhammad said, I don't know how to read. Because he had something in his hand for him to read. So if you go with the traditions where the spirit just shows up with no writing, Iqra can only mean recite. So why would Muhammad say, I don't know how to recite? That's stupid. That didn't make sense. So some Muslims caught on. Oh, you know what? Let's come up with a tradition where it says he came with a piece of writing. Silk brocade with writing on it. Now it makes sense. He said, I don't know how to read. But some actually argue that if you look at the Arabic and you Arabic speakers can compare it, ma ana biqari can mean, I don't know. How to read, or it can mean, what shall I read? It means, uh, what should I read? That's what it means. What should exactly. I read? Exactly. One of the two. That's so exactly. it's all That's over exactly. the place. But now let's go with the tradition that says, Gabriel appeared with silk brocade, writing on it. Let's just go with that one. And he says to Muhammad, read. Well, didn't Allah know Muhammad is illiterate? illiterate? Yeah. So why would he send Gabriel with a piece of writing when Allah knows Muhammad can't write? Uh, can't read and then on top of that tortures him squeezes him to the point muhammad says i felt like i was about to die and do it three times okay the first time read i can't read you think he gets it 
But then again, he says, read. And again, he says, I can't read. Dude, didn't you get it the first time he can't read? So why are you torturing this man, making him feel like he's about to die, feeling like he's violated, telling him, read three times when he's telling you, I don't know how to read. Don't you get it? And then the fourth time, he then says, okay, repeat after me. How stupid is this tradition? And if Allah can do the miraculous, such as Jesus breathing life in the dead, couldn't he miraculously cause his prophet to read? Or did Muhammad's illiteracy make Muhammad impotent? See how stupid the narration is? So either way, you embarrass yourself. Oh, okay, so about miracles, what kind of miracles that Muhammad did in Islam? Like they couldn't prove that he's a, a prophet or he's a nephew. Well, the what miracle is, friend, what, that what he could brought. have sex with 11 wives in one round because he used to eat a lot of harissa. That's the miracle. Well, is there any, any proven miracles like that he did? See, again, you Kafir, you're not listening, Kafir. Kafir. You're not listening. The miracle is Muhammad could have sex with 11 <laughs> wives in one round because he used to eat harissa and was given the sex time with 30 Sam, men. I know, I know you're being sarcastic, but Kafir, that's me. You got to cut my neck and I have to pay jizya. Oh, so darn it. it. No, yeah. Abu Layla, Abu Layla, Abu Layla, don't you know that the most most mir uh, miraculous thing that happened to uh, Muhammad that uh, he got his his male, you know, his penis was was like long enough. That's how you know he's from God. Then, but you're forgetting the part. Some traditions because you see Harisa. Harisa, yeah, Harisa makes him. That's that's a big check. Actually, this is an invention. That's the Viagra invention uh, that uh, Muslim actually. See, this is why you kafirs need to be beheaded. Muhammad invented Viagra. Muhammad was the first pimp, Arabic pimp, because he prostituted women. And Muhammad also came up with Viagra, Harissa. That's why when you eat Harissa, you get excited and you want to get married. See, now, hey, Sam, not, Sam, listen, Sam, the non-Middle Easterners, the non-Middle Easterners don't know what we're talking about. Harissa mm -hmm. is a dish. It's a, it's a food item. Uh, is there... so, Sam, Sam, if our, 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 like, if our argument surrounded with, you know, the miracle is the sex and all that, so what what is what is the ten awrat that women has that you know if if it's it's all about sex it has to contain with the other um, yeah. you know with the women so why they condemn women with their awrat why is it one ma male will cover one and nine will cover the 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 coffin like and the grave will buried. cover the tenth one yeah and the grave yes. covers the tenth one nine oh. nine of them covered by the by the coffin and one by the male. So yeah. why is it so like why is it so so male like so manly so like women doesn't have no yeah. right hold on wait let me let me hold on bro let me call Muhammad from the grave and ask him hold on I got his number can I okay. let me call him no no let no. me call him what? But I just want to see what's now, the hey, okay anyway I hope I answered your question because we're gonna be here all night you asking me these questions but I'm gonna call Muhammad he's buried in Medina let me ask him hold on I got a direct line to Medina uh Muhammad yeah why is it all about men and you know violating women Send him, send him my rewards. Tell him, uh, say hello to Aisha. Aisha, Aisha, smoke some hashisha. All right. Any other questions, guys? Come on, ask me some other. <laughs> gonna be all night talking about this stuff. Anything else? Anything so, pertaining to the topic, y'all? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, when we talk about, because uh, it is funny, because uh, when we pointed out all these things in the Quran, how pretty much everything that is revealed is essentially its own independent. Uh, divine being mm -hmm. and you know they point to the trinity saying like oh well this doesn't well this doesn't make sense even though that they say that they they really they try to underplay a lot of this by yes. trying to say that oh it's, it's a misunderstanding or oh you're just not getting it and uh no it's because they think you're ignorant of the islamic sources so they can get away with murder but that's why you don't let them get away with murder why do you think i called out muslim metaphysicians say let's debate Tawheed, now that you're a Sunni Muslim, see if it will pass your own stringent standards of logical coherence. If he's scared to debate you, then God, good, like, you know, Lord forbid he ever debates somebody like Kai. I hope he gets on here too, by the way. No, he's, he's not going to debate this topic. He knows better. He knows not okay. to do it. But so that's the whole point. So I know he's debating with the Clark Kent of Orthodox philosophy. I keep forgetting his name. That handsome guy, that guy with the glasses looks oh, like Clark Lewis. Kent. No, not Lewis. Dude, Lewis doesn't look like Clark Kent. 
I'm trying to think because you know he wears glasses. Doctor, yeah, Bo Branson. Bo Branson is it? I think that's. I, I think yeah, that's he, a- he's an Orthodox philosopher who's an expert on the monarchy of the Father, of the Trinity, of the Father's monarchy. They're having a discussion in a few days on I don't know what channel, and the guy looks like Clark Kent. I mean, you look at him like, dude, man, what's your kryptonite? But anyway, <laughs> any other questions, guys? Ask me some questions. If not, we'll wrap it up because it's you know. Yeah, Shack, Shackle, do you have a question, Shackle? No, um, maybe when Sam leaves, uh, I'll ask you a question. Okay. All right. Okay, so everyone got it now. You understand how to use these arguments because these are from their sources. I didn't make it up. They're from Sunni sources, Salafi sources, Ashari. <clears throat> this is what they're supposed to believe. Now, Shia don't believe it. Quran only don't believe it. So this aspect of the Quran has no relevance to them. This is why I say a Muslim metaphysician eventually is going to go back to being a Quran only because he's going to see the problem he faces if he's going to profess to be a Sunni Muslim. He's not going to, he's not going to be able to defend this. This is, this is irrational garbage. Yeah. But if there are no questions related to the topic, then guys, that's it. We got to do a part six on the Black Stone and the Spirit. We're done. The series yeah. is done. Uh, that one's going to be fun. Course. The Rook. <clears throat> okay, guys, if that's it, no questions, and we're wrapping it up, brother. Yep, we're going to we'll go ahead and wrap this one up, my friends. All right, guys, uh, wait, 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 wait. Prayer. all of us in the front lines, we're putting our lives on the line, not because we're heroes, because we're compelled to do it by the spirit. So what they did to that young lady, Deborah, imagine what they want to do to people like David Wood or Avery or myself or anyone that's visible and destroying Islam. But our life is different from Jesus Christ. Calm down. Bro, no, Shaco, relax, bro. Relax. Calm down before I calm you down. Stop barking before I punish Muhammad. Pit on Muhammad. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Shut the heck about? up. Shut up. I anyway. think Jacob. I, I think Jacob. I have Jacob one more question, Sam. On, how about, on, how about on, bowling hold by on, you? Hold on, hold on. I think okay. Jacob Jacob had a question. Jacob? Go ahead, brother. Um, it was it was more of a it was more of an addition to what Sam said, or, or maybe not in this. Uh, maybe like a like a, it supports Sam, but it doesn't support Sam at the same time. It, 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 oh, in, in so you the, want to be logically incoherent like the Quran? Okay, go ahead. No, 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 no. I mean, it it, it supports you, but it con- it, it, it contradicts you. It, it says something yeah, else, so but it supports you. Logically incoherent, your logically inconsistent. Like no, 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 no. No, 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 no. It's it's another. Uh, it's hey, about brother, the. Can you, you get said your question, it, brother? Brother, get okay, to your okay, question sorry. before the rapture. Before the rapture, so we okay. don't leave you behind. Get to the question. You said you said uh, you said something about how illiterate uh, w- was misunderstood or whatever. But yeah, I, um, in my in my dictionary, I have, uh, I have a, I sent you a message about what the dictionary says, and in my dictionary, uh, oh, here we go. uh brother, can you show me? Means, uh, Okay, mm-hmm. I, you can take that dictionary, send it to me so I can use it for toilet paper. Can you show me what the word ummi means in the Quran? I'm going to give you mm-hmm. where it appears. The word ummi, ummiyun, chapter 3, verse 20 of the Quran, chapter 3, verse 75, chapter 62, verse 2, and chapter 7, verse 157. Listen, listen, listen. Chip, listen more than well, you I speak just, so you can get it. Oh, here we go. Allahu Akbar. Listen more than you speak so you can see where the word is used. Chapter 3, verse 20 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verse 75. Chapter 7, verse 157 and 62, 2. You, your dictionary can say anything it wants. Go to the verses, see how it's used. The word ummiyun in the Quran refers to those who were not versed in previous scriptures. It refers to yeah, lettered folk who do that. not. You want to talk over me, brother? Keep uh, talking. Okay. okay. It's used of people who did not know the scriptures in contrast to Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book. I know how the word is used. You can give me 50 dictionaries that is based on, influenced by modern Muslim scholarship. But the way you determine meaning of words is by its contextual use. There's nothing in the Quran that interprets Ummi, Ummiyun, as someone illiterate. It refers to someone unlettered, meaning not educated read in scriptures in contrast to the people of the book. I gave you the verses, chapter 3, verse 20, chapter 3, verse 75, chapter 7, verse 157, and 62, verse 2. If that's the question, then that's it. Let's move on. Okay, brother. Does the literature have two meanings? Does the literature have two meanings? Good night, brother. May you have sweet dreams. May you have sweet dreams. 
All right. Anything else, Avery, or we're done? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, for, for brother, for right, long, brother. I just came up. Did you have a question for Sam before again, man? No, I didn't have a question. Just want to say, everybody, thank you all for doing the work that you all do. I God love this guy's you accent. You Armenian yes. handsome beast. You go ahead. <laughs> Glory be to God. I, I don't have any question. I just came up, came above to say, uh, I love you all. Uh, blessed Lord for for your work. So, uh, amen, brother. That'll be it. I love you too. Hey, brother, if it's any solace, John. I love me too. John, I have a question here. You about, uh, okay. Hey, no guys, do you questions. want to stay here till two in the morning? Okay, Come no on, more, guys, go to no sleep. Man, no more questions. He'll right, be no back. Questions. He'll be back. Right. So join, join the club. Uh, I follow you. I follow you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Permission. Follow me. Make sure you're only following me if I'm going to heaven. If I'm going to hell, then take the detour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll you, be sir. back. Thank we'll you. be back on us, guys, for, for more questions and stuff like that. So Okay, guys. Uh, yeah. Keep us in prayer, like I was saying, that God will preserve us, our lives and hands of Jesus. That's why you Muslims can threaten. We're going to destroy Muhammad until the Lord comes, and we will rejoice when we see Muhammad bow before the feet of Jesus, before Jesus damns him to hell where he deserves. May you be saved before you share the same fate of your fake prophet who's burning in hell for the misery and the destruction he's brought on lives. Lord Jesus, erase his name and his filthy book and arise and be glorified. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we trust in you. You are the Son Amen. of God, the love of the Spirit. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, guys. Amen. 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 Okay, take care, haters. We'll see you guys later. <laughs> all right. Thank you, sir. All right, I'm uh, just going to end this live broadcast now. Thank you all for coming through. I hope you enjoyed the session. Be back for part six and possibly the finale, I think it will be, when we go over the Rook and the Black Stone. So God bless everyone. I thank you all. And uh, we'll bless. see you next time.